it, it was awesome. Beers were flying. Um, everybody's going crazy. It's just kids, uh, just drunkest guy in the room. I imagine <laughs> he was, he was pretty tame. He was pretty tame. I've definitely been to some games where kids might've been the drunkest guy there in the stadium <laughs> of a hundred thousand people. Yeah. <laughs> Four play presented by Barstool Sports, actually presented by Chevy, brought to you by Barstool Sports. I have to get used to that one. That's my first time doing it with the new Chevy sponsor. Um, it's the Trent and Frankie show for a little bit here. We have Danny Rapp joining us wherever the hell he is. Who knows what Danny Rapp's doing right now, but he's pushed this podcast back an hour and a half. And when we're <laughs> welcome to Barstool, Danny, like we're just going to air you out when you make us wait. This is what we talk about when you're not here. We talk shit behind your back. The guy is absolutely off his rocker thinking we're going to wait an hour and, and a half for him sitting here looking at a computer screen. So Trent, how are you doing on this fine Monday afternoon? I'm doing really well. It's great to see you. It's great to talk to you. Yeah, Danny Rapp is not here yet. He pushed the record time back a bunch. So we just decided to hop on. I'm sure he'll hop on here in the next five to 10 minutes. Riggs, I actually don't know where Riggs is. I forget the reason why he's not here, but he's not here today. So for the first part of the show, it's going to be us two. Um, Danny's going to join at some point. It's going to be the three of us. And then at the end, we've got Harris English. But right now, it's just me and you, pal. How are you? I'm doing fantastic, man. You know, I went to the Islander game last night. I'm feeling, I'm feeling the rush still. The Islanders are just on an absolute roll. Brock Nelson scored a, scored a, a goal, came out after and saw us, and it was just seeing that guy's face after a big game was amazing. Um, and yeah, no, I, oh fuck. Speaking of hockey, oh shit, I got to do this. I have to wear this fucking jersey today. Oh, you told me about this bat. The, I had the a little Predators bit of a friendly bat. wager with Matt Duchesne on the on the National Predators, and he was basically like, "Oh, if the Predators win, you got to wear a jersey on the podcast, and if the Islanders win, I'll like wear like four play merch, and I'll I'll buy a bunch of Black Friday four play merch." I was like, "No problem." The Islanders are a wagon. National beat us two times in a row, so it's like <laughs> I have to. He sent me this jersey. I got to put this. Throw on. that thing on right now. Matt yeah. Duchesne sent you a jersey. It's actually a really sweet jersey. He, Frankie was showing it to me before. It's a Nashville Predators jersey, and they've got little things on it that are musical. There's, uh, I don't know if he'll show it, but on the back there's the number 95, and there's guitar strings going through it. On the on the collar where the tag usually is, is a bunch of piano <sighs> keys. So it's a very yeah. There you go. You look great. Um, it's a very yellow. I was just telling them about the cool parts of the jersey. Can you show the piano keys on the I'm not happy collar? wearing another team's colors right now. I'm die hard blue and orange. I am probably the craziest fan you'll ever find when it comes to a team. The fact that I'm wearing this is making my blood boil right now. But, yeah, there's a lot of cool little things on this jersey because it is Nashville. Um, I mean, it, it is a sick jersey. The logo is unreal. So on the back, on the number, it has strings that go across the number. And those indicate or those represent um, a guitar string. And then on the back collar here, they have a bunch of keyboard uh, piano keys. So it is a very cool music city type of um, jersey. So thank you to Matt Duchesne. You win the bet. It is what it is. The Islanders have bounced back, and I'll wear this for the podcast. And hopefully people don't hold this over me every single time I post about the Islanders. I'm in another team's jersey. Nobody watching or listening to this show thinks, well, Frankie's a fake fan. <laughs> He's wearing this jersey. That's not how your reputation has been preceded. You're, you're a long Island. You're an Islanders guy. That is a great looking Jersey. Matt Duchesne. Um, we had him on the show. That was a while ago now. Yeah. It was during COVID. He like opened up about, about a bunch of things. He's just yeah. a really cool guy. Good guy. Um, helped me out actually a little bit with my bachelor party. It's going to be down in Nashville. He's like giving me all recommendations and restaurants and stuff. So he's just a really good guy. Um, so, you know, had to pay up my side. So, um, Are so you we have prepared a for, for your, your bachelor party situation. Not really. Okay. I don't think so. I don't think. Anyone's... How many have you been to at this point? I've been to a bunch. Okay. So you're somewhat prepared. Well, I say a bunch, like four or five, I think at this point. That's a bunch. All right. So I, yeah, I think I'm ready mentally. Um, I have a lot of guys going, so that's going to be a shit show, but it's nice to like be the one that other people are going to have to do all the bullshit. I'm just going to kind of show up. I feel like I, like when you're in the group text, like figuring out what flights you're going to book and what the Airbnb situation is going to be. It's always stressful. Like, Everyone's talking about money. So at least this this aspect, I'm just like, I'm just gonna show up. So that's gonna be fun. I'm actually looking yeah, forward that's, to that. Yeah, that's a good spot to be. There's yeah, you can either be the guy who's getting married, or there are pockets of friend groups where you don't have to deal with anything. Like being in a wedding party is much better than being a best man. Hundred percent. Like if you if you get in that little gray area where you don't have to plan anything, but you get to be even being part of the wedding party sometimes is a drag because there's so many pictures beforehand. If you are 
like if you're an usher or even a little, a level below that, where you get to come to the wedding, it's the best, you love everybody who's there, but you don't have to have any sort of commitments. That's a good pocket of friendship to be in. I, I, uh, so I asked my buddy Kyle to be my best man and under his breath, he's like, oh, she's got to give a speech in front of Dave Portnoy now. It's just something I got <laughs> <Dude, I> to <gotta> do. <laughs> that is, that's something I had not thought about for your best man. There's going to yeah, be Dave Portnoy. His- if he's not busy, if he's in attendance, he yeah. will... Kyle will have to give a speech in front of him. I I've only given one best man speech and it's the most nervous I've ever been in my entire life. And it was just, you know, friends, aunts, uncles, all of these people. And I was still super nervous, but having Dave Portnoy in attendance, I've actually, we went to Marina's wedding yeah. like a year and a half ago yeah. and we watched a guy give a best man speech in front of Dave and, and the guy was hammered. It was a little bit of a, you know, he was just talking really slowly, which was, which was the issue. The speech itself was fine. But yeah, if I had that in the back of my mind, like, all right, I'm going to go up there. I'm going to give this speech that historically is supposed to be emotional, but also kind of funny, but not too long and not too short. And, you know, there's just a lot of pressure on it. Put Dave Portnoy in attendance and I would be I, I think I might skip. I might opt out if I if I had to give a speech in front of him. From Bolt to Blazer, Equinox to Silverado, Chevy EVs are for everyone everywhere. I went on Chevy.com last night and I started building out all the different variations of Chevy cars that I'm going to try and start looking at. I'm going to go looking. I'm going to start test driving. I'm, I need a new lease. I'm getting all the emails from my current car company saying that your lease is up in five months. What car are you getting? Are you going to extend? Are you going to buy? Are you going to come back? Are you going to get a new one? I'm going to Chevy first. Chevrolet is my first stop. I, I gotta tell you guys something building out cars on websites is a lot of fun it's so fun you're you're a very creative you're a builder did you play roller coaster tycoon when you were growing up i used up? to love roller coaster tycoon there you go i love it I, yeah i love the creativeness about it i love picking all the different trims the different color aspects the themes the infotainment system seeing how much money you can afford and then you finally build your biggest one and you're like oh my god it's really expensive how is it that much in a month but the amazing thing about chevy's is it's not it's affordable they are for everyone everywhere a few of chevrolet's beloved and best selling have been designed as electric vehicle models powered by what is this now ultium ultium is the uh thing that's, that's- that sounds like something Iron Man uses. Yeah, Ultium for an all-electric future. Equinox EV, Blazer EV, and Silverado EV are powered by Ultium. Chevrolet has electric vehicles available now, so buy the Bolt EV and the Bolt EUV. Reserve for now the Blazer EV and the Silverado EV. Those are coming out. They are incredible vehicles. We saw one actually at the uh, Barso Classic. It was on one of the holes for the hole-in-one hole. They are affordable, so you don't have to be rich to get an EV. We've said that already. Um it's an amazing brand. It's it's America's brand. Chevy has always just been there. They're like a rock. They're the top of the food chain when it comes to American cars. I love them. With an established full-line brand like Chevrolet, they can offer EVs with the volume, variety, and the value that customers all over the world have come to respect. So make sure you go and check out Chevrolet EVs for everyone, everywhere. Um, we have some... Uh, housekeeping to go through tonight or i'm sorry thursday night is episode two is that right is it thursday night or tuesday Tuesday night so tonight tonight is episode two of myrtle beach episode one i thought went fantastically we played a game of wolf we also did a home run derby at the uh, myrtle beach pelican stadium which i i've watched some clips of my swing and it's just brought me back man there's nothing better than seeing yourself do some athletic uh, activity and you do it well even though it was warning track power it's still there's this one shot that I've watched maybe 85 million times of a GoPro shot of the ball just going into the sky. And it's like, wow, you know, in another world, maybe that was something right there. You know what I mean? Like that was just a cool, nice swing. It was very it was. like simulation theory esque, where it's like, why the fuck is there that footage of me hitting a baseball? Yeah, you, you did put it out and I watched it. It's it's a nice swing and it looks good. You're right. It was warning track power, but who cares? Nobody has to. Know. I am you warning just- track power. You see my legs? Right. If you didn't have warning track power, you would have tried to be a baseball player for longer. (laughs) Exactly. Right. Like if if your future was supposed to be that, it would have been. So that's coming out tonight. Episode two. Then I believe episode three is Thursday night. I believe so. Yeah. So we're just cranking these things out. We also have two episodes of Breaking 90 coming out within the next two weeks. I'm starting to work on the actual round. And then I think someone back at the office is working on 
the um, lesson that you got with John Tillery. So we've got those coming out. We've got two episodes of Myrtle Beach coming out. We've got the Ozarks coming out at Big Cedar Lodge right before the new year. So we've got a lot of stuff coming out on our YouTube page. It's only going to be heavy hitters right now. We're just we're just giving you the fastball. Also, Danny Rapp's still not here. It's an absolute joke. This guy's a fucking joke today. It's insane. I mean, what the hell is he doing? I want to know what he was actually doing this entire time, by the way. When he comes on, we'll find out. we're going to grill him. Um, and then Thursday... Big news with PGA Tour 2K23. This is exciting stuff, Trent. What's happening on Thursday? Give us the down low. Is it the down low? It the can low be the down? down low or the low down, whichever Give one you want to say. Give us the down low about what's exactly going on on PGA Tour 2K23 starting Thursday, December 8th, going through, I believe, December 14th or 15th. So there is going to be a breaking 90 game mode on PGA Tour 2K23. Woo! Further proof that we're living in a simulation or, or whatever you want to call it. Um, they are making the breaking 90 game mode available. I believe it's the December 8th through the 14th. And you will try to attempt to break 90. And the more that you break 90 over 18 holes of golf, you will unlock more barstool merch on in the game. Right. So that's coming on the 8th. That was that was a Mark Burns on Twitter special. He dropped that on Friday or Saturday and was just like, hey. 2K just announced that, you know, that series that you guys watch on YouTube, the breaking 100, the breaking 90, that's going to be in the game. And I will say when I remember talking to somebody from PGA, from 2K at the Long Island Barstool Classic Mm -hmm. and just trying to come up with ideas on how to make it interesting and how to get people involved with it. And I had mentioned like, it'd be fun if there were a game mode on there where guys where players tried to break 90 like me. And, you know, they were like, yeah, that is a good idea. And then they eventually just decided to roll it out. And that's coming December 8th through the 14th. Try to break 90. Do it a bunch of times. The more times you do it, the more Barstool merch you're going to have available. It's very exciting stuff. It's very cool. It's fake world type stuff that we're living in. I mean, the fact that you can play a full round in the video game and unlock different uh, features and different types of merchandise from us. I've seen some shots of what our merchandise looks like in the game. It's insane. Our merch team, Pilar and Allison, actually like curated what we would wear in real life. So when our characters are inserted into the game, they're going to be wearing the stuff that we usually wear on the golf course. Like for me, it was like the blue Unreal shirt with a little bit of the Transfusion logo. And then it's like gray pants. I'm like, that's just what I wear all the time, man. So it's amazing the stuff that's going into that game. If you don't have PGA Tour 2K23 yet, you're missing out because this game is so much fun. We play Divot Derby all the time. Um, I have breaking news that Danny Rappaport has finally joined the podcast. Danny, what the fuck have you been doing for the last hour and a half? <laughs> if I told you, I'd have to kill you. What have you been doing? I have been trying. I was trying to get in touch with someone for, across the world, and we had a little bit of issues with uh, timing. We figured it out, and then I needed to get something out a little bit early. As you can tell, I'm out of breath. I've been running you around. Are. It's a tough performance. Look, it's it's a tough You're one. I realize that. Around. I know. I know that Frankie's usually the one we're waiting for. This was my Frankie moment, and I do apologize. I'm happy that you guys started. Dude, I've though. never made anyone wait on the podcast for this long of a period of time. It's like maybe two or three minutes while you guys are setting up. Never have I said, when the podcast starts at 11 o'clock, can we do 1230? Are you insane? You know how many things I've pushed around today to make sure the podcast was at 10, it was at 11, now it's at 12, now it's at 1230. So we just said, fuck it, fuck Danny. We're just going to do the podcast ourselves. <laughs> how, um, yeah, I... We've never had a, the what do you recording. Mean you were waiting push- for someone across the world. I don't understand what that means. What interview was this? Is this for foreplay? Was this uh, like? Are- I, yeah, it's for it's for this brand that we're working on. Okay, okay. okay. Uh, he's Danny gone. Rappaport so Danny Rappaport has, has, left. has left the podcast. Holy shit! Um, I'm sure we'll get to talk about um, Victor Hovland at the Hero uh, Championships. That was awesome. The Heroes obviously delivers every single single year. It's a small field. It's the best players. Tiger Woods is there. He looked incredible all week, even though he didn't play. The pictures that came out of him that are going so, that are going viral of him driving that golf cart with fucking Charlie. He's got the backwards hat. Charlie looks like Charlie looks like a 20, he's growing up. Charlie looks like a twenty five year old fucking like weightlifter at this point. This kid is stocked. He is ready to go. I can't wait for the PNC coming up. It's insane that we get to watch Tiger Woods play golf this week, and we get to watch Charlie hit a golf ball. But yeah, those pictures that are coming out of Charlie and Tiger were nuts. I mean, the guy, I know the guy can't walk, but he's never looked better, if that makes any sense. Like, he's never right. looked better in my eyes. It was a bummer that he didn't play, obviously, but 
just having his presence at a golf tournament is is a 10 out of 10. When he's driving that car around with the backwards hat and the sunglasses and Ooh. Charlie's on there with him, those are those are moments that are just fantastic. And it would have been great if he could have played. But if he's not going to play, and this is almost for every golf tournament going forward, just hang around, show up. I know it's, it'd be a ton of travel, but just having Tiger Woods on a golf cart cruising around makes everything Dude, better. Tiger rolling around in that cart with the backwards hat made me tuck it into my waistband. It was an instant <laughs> boner. It was like I'd never seen anything like it. Him doing anything on a golf course just wins. We've always said that when he steps off grass, he's kind of like a zero. When he's like just in a restaurant or he's like driving a car or whatever, he just doesn't know what to do. But when he's on grass, the guy is a 10 out of 10. No one can beat him. Best, best to ever walk on grass regardless of what he's doing. Did you guys watch the uh, the hero shot thing? The like little wedge competition they yes. had. Yes. First of all, really, really cool. Like, actually, was really fun to watch, and maybe kind of excited for the TGL thing that he's doing with JT and with Spieth and with McElroy, the tech thing. Like, those guys are funny, and watching him like shoot the shit with JT about Matt Fitzpatrick's swing and about Max Homa's swing was awesome. But I don't know if you guys saw the actual shots that he hit. Did you guys see the shots that he hit? No. No, they left it out of the video that I watched. <laughs> yeah, they left it out of the video because he hit six shots. It was 87 yards, and not a single one found dry land. Really? Yeah, it was It was kind of a rough scene. I don't think he's like – I think he's in full rest mode, and I think it takes him like two and a half or three hours to get to a point where he can play golf right now, and I don't think he went through that like routine. So perhaps we should give him some leeway. But, yeah, he like sculled the first one directly over it chunk the next two dylan DeChair has this video that i think will never see the light of day that is like 45 seconds of tiger woods just hitting wedge after wedge after wedge after wedge straight into the water oh. that being said you're right just ha just having him around is like it makes like it makes it feel like everything is right in the world and i'm surprised i'm also surprised at how he did an interview a couple weeks ago with charlie on the golf like charlie's he's doing interviews with charlie now charlie is like yeah. out there there's no more like everyone mm -hmm. said oh let this kid do his own thing let this kid do his own thing tiger woods is putting him in front of a microphone he's he's grooming him for the public spotlight because he knows that no matter what he does it doesn't matter if he keeps him in a closet people are going to talk about tiger woods uh, talk about charlie woods he's tiger woods son and so now he's getting him out there in front of the media and getting him repetitions and we're going to see a lot more Charlie Woods in the next couple of years. Like, I don't think this guy is going to be as private as he was. I think Charlie Woods is going to become someone that we, like, hear from. I think it's going to start in a couple of weeks. It was funny. When you were talking about that chipping um, and how Tiger did not perform well, I was thinking about the scene in Anchorman where he's at the bar. And they're like, play the jazz flute. Play it. Just play it. <laughs> and he's like, no, no, no. I'm not going to do that. And then he gets up and he crushes it. The Tiger chipping thing, unfortunately, was the opposite. You hope in that situation that he's going to step up and be like, all right, I'll try one. I'll do one or two. And he sinks the first one and sits down. I agree with you on the Charlie Wood stuff. He is – because when the first clips came out of Charlie a couple of years ago now, they were – it was literally someone hiding in the bushes and mm -hmm. taking videos of him on the range. And now it seems like Tiger, you know, maybe Charlie said something to him or Charlie is just he's decided that he wants to be maybe not in the spotlight, but he wants to try to pursue this golf thing in a real way. And what better way than to just it's maybe not the best, but it might be just throwing him to the fire and having him do these interviews. And, you know, this is what your life is going to be like as the son of Tiger Woods. And you you got to know that the cameras are always going to be there. There's going to be these expectations that are completely unfair but they're still going to be there and you got to get used to that and he i think they've reached a point where that's just what's going to be like going forward i mean he's a son of god it comes with a lot of baggage it is what it is you know what i mean yeah right. historically that one came always, with a lot of baggage yeah historically it's always been a tough role to fill into when you're the son of god and it's just hopefully charlie can step up to it um what what's the um what's the name of what they're going to be doing the prime time like like quirky golf stuff so the the name of the company is called tomorrow sports tmrw but i think TMR. the actual t tomorrow but the, i think the actual league is called the golf league tgl so okay. i think tomorrow sports has like wants to do more things than just tgl okay so i've actually heard from some sources on the agronomy side um they were in a meeting at michigan state uh at the uh that's like the where they all go right well, yeah. So all the yeah, yeah. So all the supers that like on Long Island have gone to Michigan State. It's insane. It's like probably the <laughs> yeah. best program in the country. But they were out there doing something. I don't know if it was like a seminar or whatever. But I guess TGR or TGL, whatever they're calling it, contacted this group because they're trying to do. And and the quote from my source was 
the craziest things you've ever seen with grass, with <laughs> real grass. So they're trying to essentially have like moving parts on these greens and fairways and tee boxes, but with real grass. So yeah, like, so like, have you guys been on a putt view, like one of those exactly that changes what I, around? What I was told, yes. Yeah, go ahead. But they want that with real grass. So like, the, all the science and the the agronomy to be able to do that with the soil and like how they're going to be able to do it is going to be insane. So they said like what they what their like aspirations for this series is going to be is pretty like out of control and it's yeah, going to so be really cool to watch if people don't know what putt view is it's one of these mats that you can move around like guy tiger has one of this house some of the new five iron golf type places i don't know if that's a nationwide but we have it in new york it's one of these indoor places where they have like simulators and food so they have this putting green that you can move around but obviously all the putting greens are are turf because they're you know they're indoors and they move around so if you want to get a putt that breaks right to left you can on your iPad set up. Okay. I want this putt to be 2% right to left. I'm guessing that they're going to try to do that with actual grass on top instead of with turf and people like this league isn't starting until 2024. So they already have these four guys on board and they already have obviously a ton of money, anything with you guys saw that list of investors. It was like Lewis Hamilton and Tom. I mean, if you weren't on that list of investors, what are you doing with your life? They have a full year to use that money and they're getting the smartest superintendents in the game involved to cook up something that probably is going to be like very, very, very futuristic. And I know tomorrow sports, like that's their whole thing. It's future looking sports, future looking sports. So we're going to see some form of a golf round on real grass in an arena. Are the events all in one place or do they travel across the country? I'm not sure about that. I know it's on Monday nights. Okay. It's, it's going to be I like a Monday they, night thing. When they teased it, it was going to be like coming to a stadium near you and stuff like that. That's so what I, yeah, I think they're trying like on to tour. do arenas, going on tour. Um, I just saw Justin Verlander just went to the New York Mets. $44 million what? a year. Two years, 86 schmill. Highest paid pitcher of all time, if that's if, if I'm correct on that. I guess that's what happens when you lose DeGrom, right? I know. I just sent it. All my buddies are Mets fans like because obviously Long Island's a hotbed for that. And I just sent in that Lieutenant Dan sitting at the bar on New Year's Eve gif of just all the confetti falling down on a very like just mute just lieutenant dan because like they're all celebrating they got verlander but come on you lost the best pitcher of all time in jacob de he didn't even tell your owner stevie fucking cohen that he was taking another offer he didn't even let you outbid the texas rangers are you kidding me fuck out of here i know he How just, old is verlander i was like just gonna say to that 40? i know he i know he just won the cy young so it's not like he is over the hill or, or whatever you want to call it. But I think he's probably 39, 40. Justin Verlander is 39 years old. Yeah. It's still a lot of money for years? Two years? Three two years? years 44, 44 million. Million. He's going to turn 40 in February. But again, he just won the Cy Young. I know. I know. I know. Certainly not DeGrom, but it's, you know, it's, it's a pretty damn good pitcher. I also saw, if we're talking contracts, I don't know if it's real or not, but again, uh, our guy Mark Burns, who I have now follow because he <laughs> you know, puts out news about us, which is <laughs> yes, cool. Definitely possible. Um, he tweeted this morning that Cristiano Ronaldo signed a two-and-a-half-year deal for $200 million a year. Yeah, so <laughs> yeah. I wrote about this. I wrote about this. Uh, I was writing about this this morning, which is one of the things I was trying to talk about with some sources over there in Asia. Okay. But, yeah. It's real, I think. I don't know if he's he's not going to sign the deal before the World Cup is over because Portugal's still in the World Cup. But yeah, they're going to pay him two hundred million dollars a year. I don't know how much of that is actually for playing soccer. A lot of it, from what I understand, is promotional stuff. Like he's gonna, you guys know how David Beckham signed that deal with Qatar. I think I've seen like that, and he's been in all these videos about like, I love Qatari restaurants. He's like, oh, I love Qatari airports, and he, right. So they're basically hiring Cristiano Ronaldo to be like the face of sport or the face of soccer in that country. And I was doing a little digging on the guy who owns the the company or owns the team that is making him the offer. And he's like the advisor to the chairman of the entertainment. It's all, they're all part of like this MBS circle right. and this vision Two Thirty thing. And this is part of vision Two Thirty. So yeah, I mean, they're not, they're not done spending on sports. Golf is just the beginning. And that's what I've kind of tried to keep talking about throughout this whole live thing is like, this is not confined to golf and they paid, Phil Mickelson, $200 million over like three years, I think. They're going to give Cristiano $200 million a year, really just to soften their image like to the rest of the world. This is this is what they're doing. They, they take our money for oil, and then they spend it on sports. And, I mean, tennis could be – like, they, the Saudis could take over tennis so quickly. Tennis, right. does, tennis is not as rich as golf, doesn't have quite the same history. If the Saudis des- decided that they were going to start like a live tennis, I mean, that would be – 
just a rounding error for them. It's just, it, this is 200 million a year. That took my breath away. Like, what is the most that an American athlete, professional athlete makes? Is it Mahomes? Does he make like 50 million a year? Yeah, I think contractually he makes like 50 million. I saw that Phil Nicholson's the highest paid athlete in the world this year because of because of Liv. Wow. He's getting like 135 million dollars a year. So I mean, Saudis, we, we they have blown the top off sports and money. It's because the money it's like means nothing. We've nothing. Seen. The money right. is legitimately fairy dust. They can just sprinkle it around wherever they want. They could it's take hundred million dollars and just toss it in the water. It doesn't it's not, matter. It's actually the opposite of fairy dust. It's it's like dirt. It's they don't even care about it. It's nothing special to them. They can throw as much of it as they want at whoever they want. Like if you're like I mean, obviously Cristiano Ronaldo is he's the biggest star on earth, maybe, according to probably Instagram followers in terms of athletes. But like if you're on if you join Live Golf, you're like, oh, Maybe I should ask for just like 10 million more and they would have been like, sure. Or 50 million more and they would have been like, sure. Tommy John knows that you're the most confident when you're in your most comfortable. That's a that's a damn fact. That is really true. Yeah, when you're not you comfortable, argue. when I'm not comfortable, I, I'm i just, I can't be asked to do anything. But when I'm wearing my Tommy Johns, I can take on the world. I wonder how many people listen to these. We've been talking about Tommy Johns for years. And I listen to a bunch of podcasts and they do ad reads and sometimes I'll skip through them. But like Tommy John's is legitimately something that's changed my life so much that I actually hope people listen to it, try it out, buy themselves a pair and then see if it's for them. Because I don't know that you can buy a pair of Tommy John's and be like, no, this sucks. It's impossible. It's, and it's it's right. And it's part of your life that you can upgrade, right? It's something that you use every day. It's, it's similar to like sheets, like people who mm -hmm. have had the same sheets for 10 years don't understand that the world has moved on to better sheets. I think underwear is the same way. There's people out there listening right now who are wearing the same holy, disgusting, barely, barely holding together underwear. And they, they don't even know, but hopefully they're learning right now that there's Tommy John's out there and it's the best underwear that money can buy and, and it's every single day it's something that you wear every, every single day. day and it's like sleeping in that way also where it's like if there's something that's worth spending money on it's something that you're going to do every single day this is me talking to you very very genuinely i'm telling you guys this would make a great christmas gift and it's not even in the read like i think if you gave your significant other if your significant other happens to be a male to, if you bought them tommy johns and they don't have it, and they never experienced this type of fabric on their nutsack and you gave this to them, they'd be like, they'd put it on and be like, what the hell is this? Like, it's a I'd whole new thank world. You. It's a whole new world. Tommy John's breathable lightweight fabric has four times the stretch of the competing brands. They come with a no wedgie guarantee thanks to a non-rolling waistband and legs that never ride up. That is true. They never ride up. It's an amazing piece of technology. Plus, they feature a horizontal quick draw fly so you can take it out when you are urinating or if you want to do something else. Hammock pouch supports, stops the awkward swing and slap, giving everyone something to be grateful for. So... Go to TommyJohn.com slash 4, F-O-R-E, right now for 20% off your first order. So if you just heard us plea to you to try and just try these things out once, you have to at this point. Go to TommyJohn.com slash 4, F-O-R-E, right now for 20% off that first order. TommyJohn.com slash 4, Seaside for details. Did you see that debate? Speaking of famous people, did you see that debate on the Barstool Instagram where they asked a bunch of people at our office, who do you think is more famous, Lil Wayne or Tom Brady? Oh, boy. I mean, it's, it's pretty it's obvious. Tom it's uh, Tom Brady by much. Yeah, it's the right? most I mean, obvious thing in the world. Yeah. Did there were some people Lil trying Wayne? to make the argument. Like, Big Ev said it was, like, it was Lil Wayne. Well, I, listen, I love hip-hop as much as the next guy, and I know Big Ev loves hip-hop. So you're kind of maybe trying to go to bat for Lil Wayne, who is – Super famous. He's really famous. A lot of people know who Lil Wayne is. Lollipop was a smash. But Tom Brady is the most famous guy in the most famous sport. I know. In this country, for sure. Right. That's what I mean. Like, he, Tom Brady is, I, you'd be hard pressed to list a couple more people who are more famous than Tom Brady, certainly in America. I just you think, think you Woods? always have to go, you have to go with that route, uh, go down the route where you say like, would my grandmother know this person? Like it hits all demographics. You know what I mean? And I just think like right. older people like have heard Tom Brady's name more than Lil Wayne. It's just a it's cult it's not like cultural age close. thing too. It's not even close. Lil Wayne is massive, massive. He's, he's huge. He's, he's not even been the most famous, famous for but he's not the most right. famous rapper. You'd say that Kanye, I would say 
Kanye is more famous than him now, especially right. now. Kanye is definitely more famous. But for 20 years, Lil Wayne has been in the culture. He's been, you know, people know who he is. But Tom Brady, dude, who is more <laughs> famous than Tom Brady in, in America? I would say do you think Tiger's more famous than Tom Brady. Yes. Yes. Yeah, probably a little bit. But it's one of those things where when you get to that level, you you almost you lose sight of the actual goal of what you're talking about. Like at, Tom Brady and Tiger Woods are so famous that there's going to be like, you're going to find one guy in Utah. Who's like, who's tiger. Who's this guy. <laughs> but overall, everybody knows who those guys are. Lil Wayne is a little different. I think there's probably, there's definitely way more people who don't know who Lil Wayne I, is. I think both my parents have no idea who Lil Wayne is. I don't know that you could find one person at the, uh, of the age of 40 that doesn't know who Ta tiger woods is in America. Over the age of 40 or under yeah, the, over, over the age of 40. Yeah. And I think all the kids know him too. Yeah, I just I think, think he, of, I, you, you pulled think every 40 year old in society. Like obviously if this person has never left like the woods or something and they're still like hunting and gathering their food in like the middle of like Wyoming, they're not going to know who Tiger Woods is, but any 40 year old right on the dot in America knows who Tiger Woods is. You've right, heard it's the when name. You start, it's when you start dipping below 25 yeah where you start to be like this generation you know has no even conceptualized version of Tiger. like the 2019 masters was a big deal to just re-up who tiger mm -hmm. woods is and put him back in the spotlight and the video but, game and the oh the video game yeah i'd say once you get to like 23 and under you're getting to a spot where people might not the know only thing tiger that makes woods me nervous is. is when we went to the first t program we uh, we donated to the first E program thanks to all the people that donated last year during our 24 hour live stream trying to make a hole in one in PGA Tour 2K21. Um, we went there and we asked the kids like, "Who's your favorite golfer on tour?" Not one person even sniffed Tiger Woods. What was it Not, Ro they didn't Ricky, even, Rory? Justin. It was a bunch of Justin Thomases, Ricky. It was a bunch Rory. of um, Colin Morikawa's, Tony Finau's, John Rahm's. Not even a person. Even I was about to say, do you guys know who Tiger Woods is? <laughs> these are like first tee program, like right, these are eight year olds and nine year olds. Yeah, I think they would know who he is. He, yeah. He's just not as in their lives as he was in our lives. That would have been. We should have. We should have asked them a follow up question and been like, who knows who Tiger Woods is? Here? Yeah. That would have been super interesting. <laughs> they had to. Though. Did right. you guys see that uh, Norman replied to his uh, thing being like, I don't pay any attention to Rory or Tiger. Like, I, I'm, I'm not going anywhere. You know, because Tiger obviously said he needs to go. They're in a, they're in a really interesting spot. Like, because now the, 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 what made all the headlines was, was Tiger saying he needs to go. But what I think is most interesting is that now you have Tiger and Rory both saying on the record that there is a path forward if this guy goes. Right. So there's probably people inside live right now that are thinking like, should we just get rid of this? Like, should we get rid of this guy? Because well, that's why you do it. Right. That's, that's why. You why do it. So I yeah. spent a lot of time this weekend talking to PGA tour people at the PGA tour. And they were like, cause a lot of people think that this is just coming straight from the mouth of the PGA tour. Right. Which is just, they've decided that this is their message and that Rory and tiger are going to carry it out. The right. people that I spoke to on the care on the PGA tour were like, no, 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 no. We want Greg in there as long as possible. Because they view Greg as like a walking gaff, right? And if Liv's ultimate mission, which I think it is, is to make a deal with the PGA Tour because nothing says legitimacy like, you know what? We went toe-to-toe -to -toe with them and now they had, to, they had to, to negotiate with us. Right. Greg Norman makes it harder to do that. And if you bring in another guy who's like a vanilla guy, he's much more likely to broker a deal with the PGA Tour. So I think they kind of went rogue. I think that's just them. They, like, these two guys, I don't think we can understate how much these two guys – hate greg norman i think it's very very personal well i mean if live i don't know where i fall if i was on the live side do you want greg norman because he's so rogue and so crazy and that he is that like villainous type of guy or do you want a legitimate a legitimatized um legitimize like, oh, fuck, a legitimized ceo like someone that fucking used to run like disney or like like an actual brand because obviously at that point a merger would would feel a little bit more realistic I don't. I said this a couple of weeks ago. I don't know that Liv ever should try and even have a merger. Why would you want to be this like up and coming tour and have the thoughts of ever succumbing to the brand that you're trying to defeat? That would that would be such a step backwards for them. I wouldn't know that that's ever in their sights at, the, at any point now. I was really giving it some thought because about like the future of Liv and where it goes and what the ceiling is for it. And I know everything I say is going to be a little biased because if you look back on all of the podcasts we've done, I've been a little anti-live. 
But if you look at their real ceiling, I, I just don't know. And again, we don't know what it is because we're in year one of this whole thing. But I, I think down the line, it makes the most sense for them to join with the PJ Tour because I don't think the team thing is going to take off the way that they think it's going to unless you have businesses come in, corporations come in and sponsor the teams and make it like F1. But I don't see that happening. Uh, and, and with the players they have, they got some big names. They got, you know, Cam Smith is huge. DJ, Bryson, Phil, all these guys. But if people stop jumping over, and there's no evidence that that's going to happen, but if it does, I, I don't think the ceiling is that high for Liv and to the point where it would make way more sense for them to join up with the PGA Tour. What makes because you think they, that the brands won't go over? Like, because nobody's just watching so this thing, man. It's just so toxic. Also, see, it's but just the, tox so toxic. the toxic part to me doesn't make sense. The the viewer the viewer point I see, but the toxic like like F one they literally own an F one company, so like, and they're just as toxic in F one as they are. And no, that's that's not me saying that it should be as toxic. I'm just saying it it, it just is. Like the discussion around live is so toxic and so political. Like when I went to the to the live event in New Jersey, the one at Trump's place, it was basically just a political rally. Yeah. Like I think of if you're going to that as a potential advertiser, you're like, I don't, I don't really want to get involved with this. You know, and it's not and it's not a value judgment. It's just it was so, so, so political. And this is not me saying one side or the other. It's just I don't think brands want to go where they're chanting, you know, let's go, Brandon, and Trump is ever like that's just a if you're a marketing department, you're like, maybe let's not get involved with that. That but also I do think the viewership is an issue. No one is watching it. They like you need people to watch for people to, for brands to be invested in something. That's just how the world works. And when you have to go to Fox and say, I want to buy TV time, that is not a valid business model. That is not something that people are going to look at and be like, Oh, there's so many eyeballs on this thing that we need to get involved here because then there's going to be that amount of eyeballs on us. I do think like, again, all of that stuff, like, Obviously, that's going to uh, be a big part of the conversation. But I do think a an, a big part of the conversation also is people aren't watching. You can't you can't run a business like that on forty five thousand concurrence. Yeah. If if it, it did is crazy, happen, like even the AFL, like the the new football league that's like been popping up. You see commercials like they're even on I think Fox Sports One or Fox at this point. So like it is true that other up and coming leagues that try and break away or try and make a name for themselves, they do get TV deals, but. Um, yeah, I think it's in such its infant stage at this point that it's hard to like press down on the success of them because they don't have a TV deal yet. We we often forget how quick this whole thing has come about. Like if we yeah. if it wasn't but, the Saudi backed league and it was just the Canadian billionaires league and they didn't have a TV deal yet, we'd be like, yeah, that's probably normal. But I mean, they would been around they'd for have like, a TV deal. I think, have, they I think they would though. Would. Oh yeah, probably. Oh yeah, yeah. if they signed like all these major winners and stuff. I think they would definitely have some sort of TV deal. I would think so. That Then I guess you're right because like, I guess the political, like the political side of it and, and how toxic the, the vibes around it are is what's stopping it. Because I don't understand why advertisers and TV sponsors and all these TV companies are seeing it any differently than when they air F1 or soccer or now like a Cristiano Ronaldo soccer game. I don't understand what the difference I, is. I do think that it, it's, it's at a disadvantage that it came up at this time right. where there's so many eyeballs on it. Social media is so prevalent. There's so much conversation surrounding it. F1. I don't even know how old it is, when it came about, where it started. Blah. I don't know any about that, but this live, we've watched it all happen in real time. Everyone has watched it. We saw what happened with the players. They grabbed how much money they got, where the backing is coming from. And there's just so much chatter around it, negative, positive, you know, toxic, whatever that when you watch it happen in real time is different than, almost having like a legacy sport where, you know, I was born, I grew up and oh my gosh, F1 is a thing. Lewis Hamilton is a star. This live golf league, watching it try to get its footing, I think has turned a lot of people off and just all of the conversation around it. The main conversation around live is not about the golf at right. all. It's about where's this money come right. from? Look at these guys who jump ship from a, you know, quote unquote, less, you know, toxic place to the super toxic place. And that turns people off that drives conversation. So having all the conversation around it be more about, can you believe these guys are doing this? Blah, blah, blah is, is definitely uh, negative. And I, I think the fact that also it went up against like an, an established American sports 
organization. I think there's definitely some undertones there. Like if if some Saudis, some Saudi team came and and took, you know, LeBron James away from the Lakers. Obviously, it's not the same thing, but it's sort of this like encroaching on something that already existed. I was also thinking about what what a combined like a merger would look like. I think what it would have to be is Live would have its own series of events on the PGA Tour. This is just speculation. Live would have its own series of events on the PGA Tour that would be like team only because there has to be some sort of differentiator and there could be some sort of like team series that, you know, the PGA Tour is moving toward this model where there's only like 20 tournaments that are really big tournaments that people are going to care about and the top players are going to play in. So you've got 30 other weeks of the year. Maybe there's like an eight event live golf team series where there are these team captains and there are sponsors because if it, if the live series is under the PJ tour umbrella and the PJ tour promotes it, I could totally see there being like a team tailor made or a team Callaway or, you know, a team Nike, them getting involved. And you have this self-contained team competition that exists within the overall PJ tour, because I think the mixed individual and team stuff is just stupid. Like the team competition just feels like such a sideshow because they're trying to have an individual tournament, but they're also trying to push this team thing and the teams have silly names and the whole thing just feels kind of kitschy. I think it would have to be like a go all in on the team concept within the PGA tour. Again, that could happen, but it's not going to happen with Greg Norman. So now there's some people, (laughs) there's tough decisions to be made at live right now. Do we go with this guy who everyone hates? Like, Tiger and Rory despise this guy, and they're still the two most powerful people on the PGA Tour. Do we double down, or do we try to compromise and meet in the middle? It's really tough, for Liv especially. Like, Obviously, Tiger and Rory say those things to put pressure on the people yes. in power to have them have the conversation that we're having right now. And from my vantage point, I do think... like. I would be curious to know if say Greg Norman steps down or whatever, they mutually decide for him to, for to go a different direction for live. Like, does that actually open a path to a merger with the PGA tour that I don't know. I think it does because not just because him leaving, but it would be a symbolic shift. Yeah. It's certainly the only way it's possible. If, if live wants to do a merger and Frankie make a good point that it's very much in its infant stage, it could just blow up and be, a real competitor to the PJ tour. But if they have merger on their mind, Greg's got to go. I just added, I just added garlic knots to an order to try and hit a delivery fee, like to try and hit the threshold. Yeah. Did you get there? Yeah, of course. Boom. Like you had itself. to add $3 and 15 cents. And the first thing that popped up was fucking garlic knots for three fifty. You kidding me? Automatic ad. Always I'm, useful. I'm officially on a diet. I have to. Oh, um, I'm sorry oh, to derail to the, the live talk, but I just thought. No, I had it's to okay. Get that out everybody know. Everybody knows. Like that's just what that's what it's it is. Right what but, do you mean you're on a diet? I, well, I stepped on the scale and I decided I'm on a diet. Was it a number that you just couldn't handle anymore? Because I thought it's you were doing I, all right. I thought you were working out. What happened to that? Do you want a better sex life? Yep. If so, Mm -hmm. you are not alone, Trent. Up to 50% of men have symptoms that get in the way of wanting or enjoying sex. But Roman, our friends at Roman, are here to help. Roman is the digital clinic for men. Digital health clinic for men. Roman addresses a variety of sexual health needs for men. Roman offers genuine medication that helps achieve and maintain a strong erection. Roman offers discreet wipes that help you last for four times longer in bed. In men with low T, getting testosterone levels back to normal can help you increase your libido. They also offer a testosterone test to help with that. And if it's appropriate for you when you take the test, treatment for low testosterone is also available. At Roman, there are no waiting rooms and no hassle. It's just a straightforward digital experience from the comfort of your own home. If medication or testing is appropriate, Roman will send it directly to your door. Everything arrives in discreet packaging with free two-day shipping. It is a no-brainer to try this out. To learn more and how you can achieve your personal sexual health goals, go to row.co slash foreplay today for 20% off your entire first order. That's ro.co slash foreplay. Try it now, 20% off your entire first order. I was, I was working out. I'll tell you what happened. I was working out 
on the treadmill for like four weeks. Pretty that's consistently. A lot of, that's, that's a lot of weeks. It's a month. Three, three to four Some people weeks. call it's, that a month. <laughs> it's, it's close to a month. And I was like, I'm doing great. You know, I didn't change my diet all that much. I tried to reel it in a little bit, but there's still a lot of ice cream deliveries coming to this apartment. But what kind of ice I cream was, are you ordering? Carvel. Ooh. The Carvalanche? You ever, do, you ever fuck around with the Carvalanche? I do, I, do the, I do the Heath Sunday. Oh, shit. Dude, try one of, these days, in it. one of these days, mess around with the Carvalanche. You won't believe what's going on with those things. I also with Carvel, the thing that they do, which I appreciate, is their sizes are so insane. Oh, that's like, small. A small is the size of your head. So I'll order a medium every time and I'll tell myself, oh, I forgot that their sizes are so different. But um, yeah, I, I, I got on the scale and I saw a number that I've seen before. Oh, what I was saying where I was working out for three to four weeks pretty consistently and I felt good about it. Didn't change my diet a ton. And then I got on the scale and almost nothing changed. Almost zero. Like, I would say I maybe lost half a pound. And, you know, people always say the diet is more important and more important than the exercise. And that is just true, man. It must be true because I was working out for an hour on the treadmill every day of the week for a month. And my diet, my weight did not change significantly at all. So wow. I have come to the conclusion that I have well, to You were go getting healthier, though. You know what I mean? Your heart was pumping. You were moving around. You probably felt better. Your your mood was probably better. So I think a lot of people would say that the argument would be to keep doing that, regardless of the of the weight not fluctuating. But I'm I'm walking around it with too much weight. Yeah, I am. Yeah. There's no doubt about that. So now, so it's a what, diet what, what are the parameters of the diet? What what's our plan? We're gonna try to really cut out carbs. Carbs. Wow. Carbs are the enemy. Carbs. You know, I thought of that too. And every time I say, I'm like, I'm going to do no carbs. I'm going to do no, no salt. I'm not going to eat cheese. I'm not going to put as much sauce on everything. And then I'm like, well, it's the fucking holidays and it's Christmas coming up. And then something. I got a fucking party coming at the house. How am I not going to eat like garlic nuts? And then it's like, all right, we'll do it in January. Oh, me and my friends are going to a ski house. I'm not going to like drink beers and eat pizza and like tacos and stuff. Like everyone's talking about all the food we're going to bring. So that's going to get derailed. And then like in February, we're going to start traveling again. Then we're going to go to the masters. And then we're going to, it's like, it's never going to end. So I might as well just keep it going. What's the fucking worst that's going to happen? No, the le- the actual <clears throat> lesson from that is there's never going to be a good time. So just start now. You know that AI thing that everyone's fucking uh, shooting around? I, lo- the, the I pictures? loved it. Look how fat so they made me look in this space photo just because just because of how fucking fat my face is right now. <laughs> look at that guy. I got to be honest, that just looks, looks exactly like you. Like me, <laughs> I know, that thing that is chin. so accurate. It's crazy Look accurate. at the mouth and the <laughs> eyes. I, I had so much fun. I showed that to everybody <laughs> at dinner. They loved it. Yeah, the uh, AI art is... I, I We talked about last podcast, but I got sent a bunch. One of me in a space suit, all this And this stuff. is just me as a lesbian, too. <laughs> <laughs> That's you. That's, that's you as a poet. You again. Yeah, dude. That's, that's you who you happened. write poetry. That guy writes poetry. A lot of poetry. Oh, a lot of sad poetry. <laughs> No, it's um, funny. It's it's. Did uh, you guys use the Lenza app? Is that the one you guys use? Think, yeah, that's what it's called. Did yeah. it? Did it? Do you think it actually takes them like a hundred minutes to do it, or do you think that they just want Mine to think that they're really? Mine took twenty-five minutes. I think it's because I have no facial features. It was super easy for them <laughs> to just. Easy. <laughs> that's funny because mine was like ninety-five minutes, and I was wondering if they were just saying that to make it seem like it was a lot, you know, more serious. You know what technology. they're actually doing is they're like, oh, oh, upload twenty photos of your face in all different ways, left, right, course, up. Dude. That's just Face ID. They're just that's trying exactly to get into your. They're just trying to get into your bank account. They're like, oh, can you actually look up and to the right? <laughs> yes. And dude. then, and then we're gonna draw this cute photo it, of you as an astronaut. But then we're also gonna take all of your money. And we're gonna freeze your accounts, and then we're gonna kill your dog. <laughs> it's just like holy shit. Yeah. yeah, I didn't. I didn't even think about that. Face, face. We thought that Face ID was like kind of a more secure version of a password, no. but turns out that's that's out the window now. It was like that game. I forget what it was where you were take like it was like take the first letter of the street you grew up on, the name of your dog, yeah. and your birth <laughs> month, and that's gonna spell your rapper name. When in reality, they were trying to get your password. Dude, trying I, to get all the cues for your password. I uploaded 20 photos to this thing and I, I all different variations of my face. And it's just as I hit submit, I was like, hmm. If you told someone 100 years that I just did that to some like Chinese like internet company, they'd be like, that's probably a, mis- a mistake. Yeah, <laughs> but we're just like, oh, that. whatever. What's the worst that's going to happen? Well, that was the same thing with the um, the old person app. Yeah. Look at yourself like an old yeah. person. Yep. That was, was that Russia, I think, if I remember correctly. Yeah, I think, so. I think, I think that, that might have been some Russian backers. I left my credit card at a restaurant the other day for like two weeks, and I just haven't gone and picked it up. 
That's something you, I would do. Have it's you been just, checking to make sure that nothing's been nothing fishy? Yeah, I keep on? looking and like I have like multiple people call and be like, hey, I think I left. And they're like, yeah, your your card's still here. It's just still sitting in this register. And you I got to go get it. You know what's an accomplishment that I'm coming up on that nobody talks about? My debit card is about to expire. Wow. Wow. You Oh, you're saying so you haven't lost it. You've made it all I the way. I haven't lost it. That's, That's the thing. insane. Like, when I was in my 20s, I you know, I lost my debit card every month. Yeah. You just you're at a bar, you leave it there and then you just never go back or you don't even remember where you were. I think the true sign of being an adult is having your debit card expire. That's the a real? good one. I, every time I log into Amazon, I, I look, I, you know, you have to like click down on your options. And that's when I'm reminded that I've had like 37 different debit cards or credit cards. I know. No, <laughs> I, this one I've, I've had for however long debit cards last. In April, I believe my, my date's coming up. So I just got to hold on for a few more months. Did they give you some sort of bonus? Nope. No, no. that's what I'm saying. Nobody, nobody talks about how impressive it is to have your debit card expire. The real problem is that when you... Um, when you lose a card like I did, like this was like this card that I left is the card that's hooked up to all my Apple Pay stuff. Like, had I needed to get a new one, like everything I buy online, whether it's like on um, PayPal or on um, Apple Pay or like Delta, it's all hooked up to this one card. Had I lost that and I had to get a new one with new numbers, my life is ruined for months, legitimately well, months. The thing- that is what I am dreading with the debit card expiring because it is hooked up to a lot of things. So I'm just, you know, it's just going to, I'm going to run out of time and I'm going to have to get a new debit card. I'm going to have to go through services that I don't even remember that I have hooked up to this thing. I don't have to give you the talk about how to not use a debit card anymore, right? Like I did to Tommy Smokes. Yeah. Yeah. Cause if they steal that, that's your real money. If they steal a credit card, that's their there's money. There's just, there's no reason to ever use a debit card if you think about it. Like, you, that's like you obviously- all I use. Right, Why? You, you, you lose the points, right? You just like there's no logical reason for using a debit card. You might as well use the thing that gives you rewards. And then also, if something was to happen where like someone hacked it or like someone stole your package, like at least you can put in like a request, like I didn't get this package, I didn't get this food. With a debit card, it's gone. Like that money's straight out of your account. At least there's like a grace period where you're like, I haven't paid this yet. Something could happen. You know what I mean? It's like never. Why do you, why do you use a debit card, Trent? That's just what Have I've always it. done. Yeah, that's that's really it. There's no there's no point system. There's no big smart reason. It's just that's what I've always done. Yeah, I think you should. I think you should use this as a sign that hey, I was mature enough to keep it, but now it's time to go credit. Correct. If you're really going to be mature, I think credit's the move. I okay. bu- I bu- Again, I bu- I'm not. I'm not. Points. This this isn't a hill I'm willing to die on. I'm diff. I'll I'll get a credit card for sure. <laughs> Definitely, no problem. No problem. I'll do it. I'll do it. You know, whenever this bad boy expires, I do want to see it through, though. I want to see the debit card through. Yeah, you I, got got some, I think at this point, I got these fucking guys coming to my house. They're fucking checking. I've had pipes like gas pipes rattling in this one part of the house. And like, we don't know what the hell happened. Like, I don't know why it's happening. But now I've got like PSEG coming to the house and they're going to be walking through. And if Danny wasn't an hour and a half late, I would have had it. I would have had it done already. But now I got people at my door. I got people fucking knocking over here. It's a nightmare. It's an absolute nightmare owning a home and like things start to go wrong. I feel like the winter is really a nightmare for owning a home. So I guess like they changed the um, the gas line in the street. Like they knocked on our door a couple months ago and they were like, hey, we're going to like put you, hook you guys up to a new gas line. We're like, cool. I don't know what the hell that means. Is our house going to explode? So they're like, are we going to do it? They went to the side of the house. They went into the street. They ripped up the whole street. They repaved it. They put in a whole new gas line. Beautiful stuff. Then as the heat started coming on in our house, because I guess the gas turns on the heat, like the central air and all that stuff. All of a sudden, it sounds like someone's in the attic fucking try, like, let me out. It's like, boom, 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 And it it's says, like, let it's, me out? It, it, I swear once I heard, let me out. I please, thought I heard, please. let me out of this fucking hellhole I thought I heard upstairs. Don't don't call PSEG. Call the police. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> call a fucking priest. But um, Right. But yeah, so I don't know what the hell it is. I don't know if it's like once they hooked up the, I got all these people in my life telling me, you know, the air can sometimes go into this pump and it's like the air hits. I'm like, I don't know anything, dude. You could come here and tell me that um, the house is legitimately falling and I'll just write you a check. I don't know anything about any of this stuff. They could just completely take advantage of me. I always kick around the idea of buying a house in my head and then I hear you talk about it and you know, it's it's similar to the credit card, debit card thing where 
it's way smarter to own a home because that money is actually going towards something. This this apartment that I got, I, I light money on fire at the end of every month. You're just paying someone else's mortgage. That's what they say. I'm paying in the someone else's. Yeah. That at some point they're just going to own this building, and I'm going to be part of the reason why they do. Mm-hmm. But also, am I going to buy? Am I going to buy a house and have all the problems that Frankie has all the time? Well, what about like a condo situation? I feel like a condo might be a happy medium for you because you own it. But then I think with a condo, if it's in a, like a building with HOA fees and stuff, they kind of take care of that stuff, don't they? I think if I'm going to make that jump where my money is going towards something, I want it to be a house. You want it to be yours? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I probably won't. I'll probably I'll probably burn money for the next five years, you know, at, at, a, at a high just rate. Paying, just paying rent with a debit card. Right. That's right. That's pretty, that's my life right now. So <laughs> you're paying rent. But with I don't a have card. to. I don't have the guy. You know, I don't have someone up in my attic being like, get me the hell out of here. So, you know, that's the trade off, I guess. What do you guys yeah. think about Victor Hovland winning the hero? The guy just loves him some wide fairways and, and ocean breezes. And he likes to get a little bit of a tan before he goes up north for uh, to Norway for Christmas. Yeah, I think he's got five five wins. Um on the PGA Tour, like PGA Tour sanctioned events, and they're just all in paradise. He won in Mexico. He's won. He won in Puerto Rico, uh, and he, he won twice in Hero. I don't know. He won twice in Mexico, twice in Hero, and once in Puerto Rico. So the guy lives in Norway, is from Norway, and lives in Oklahoma. So it's not like he grew up in Florida. But I guess the guy just loves himself some resort golf. Is he, Did you guys watch it? A, I, mean, it felt- he, I watched a little bit of it. Yeah, I saw Scotty uh, chip in, and then Victor answered. It also got me thinking like Tiger never w- would have been able to compete in that tournament had he played. These guys are so fucking good. It made me think like this guy's got no chance ever when I was when they're playing against right, the best he's gotta, in the world. He picks the field. He's got to pick a less tough field. Dude, like Scotty's chipping in for an Kisner's eagle. making a hole in one. Kisner's making a hole in one. And Hovland just answers with another birdie right on top. It's just like how could fucking Tiger ever go that low right now? But Ever. then he said he shot 63 and 64. Did you guys hear that on the broadcast? Yeah, on his home course. You know, like, undocumented, I will say. Why, are you calling out Tiger Woods' scoring integrity? No, I'm just saying that, well, maybe I am to a degree. because so It kind of sounds like you are. He, I, listen, I want to get as excited about those 63s and 64s that he that he talked about. But he also said that when he followed it, he was like, I also can't walk very much. So he did not shoot those numbers, you know, in a real round pj to a round like way but I, I i just i think he shot them i'm just i'm with frankie i don't think he would be able to compete very much no, i probably would have said told- that prior to the 2019 masters also so the guy can always just surprise us if we watch him play maybe at the pnc this guy's going to be firing darts at every single uh, every single stick he's going to be draining putts his drives are going to go further than everyone else in the, in the field and then we'll be like holy shit this guy can go low but when you're not watching him golf you forget like you think like he's almost like one of us, or it's like he could never go out there and fucking do this right now. There's no way. You see how good these guys are? You think Tiger can be one of them? You like forget that he is at that level when he's playing golf. Right. And so I asked him last week, as, I, as we talked about, like, would you ever take a cart? And he just looked at me so dead in the eyes. It was like, I would never do that. That's what he said. I would never do that. But I think after hearing about the 63s and the 64s, and if we see him in the in next uh, on Saturday in the match and next week in the PNC, if we sh- see him shoot 65 or, you know, or look like PJ Tour ready, the calls for him to take a golf cart are only going to grow louder and louder, and he's only going to just keep saying no and no and no and no mm. longer and longer. Could could he get the golf version of wheelies? I feel like that might be worse on his leg. Like you think so? I don't know, dude. Bro, imagine I, I him. Just, imagine him gliding down. He needs the motor just on his heels or heelies is what they're called. Yeah. If he's just get a golf version of heelies and just have him cruising down. A, now the the potential for disaster certainly goes up but if you just you know find a nice downhill fairway yeah that's you're saving like a thousand steps if you think about where he is in his life and his career right now it's it's kind of just ridiculous he there's a lot of guys on tour who have seen the up there's like this picture of tiger's leg that some people have seen right after the accident i obviously have not seen it but i know that there are a number of tour pros pros who have seen it and the fact that he can shoot 63 or 64, even in a golf cart, on a real golf course, because it's definitely a medalist, and Tiger's definitely not playing the upties. That's that's for sure. Right. The guy can shoot 63 or 64, and and when you talk to the guys, like, the fact that he can do it after, I just really want to see this picture is what this is coming do down you to. Do you, though? 
the guys who have seen this picture, when you ask them about it and then and say, okay, he made the cut at the Masters, they they they, they, they look at you like it's the most incredible accomplishment. That's it. The guy can still shoot sixty three with that leg. That it's, sounds like something you'd find on four chan or something. I I mean, I think that's probably harder to get your hands on than anything the president's ever seen that picture. But people have seen it and and they they get squeamish thinking about it. Like if I offered you a, a chance to look at that picture, would you guys look at it? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. It's like the um it's like the briefcase in Pulp Fiction. Just let me I'll, see what it is. KFC once showed me a guy getting his fucking asshole prolapsed by another dude. He he got that, that I ever ever since I saw that last year, I don't care about anything else you don't feel anything anymore. i don't feel and anything Tiger was like i gotta figure out my walk he's like my game's there i just gotta figure out my walking so this guy's probably like going back to the drawing board with walking specialists and being like all right he's gonna get all the walking specialists in the world in a room and say okay let's let's talk here what what can we do because the, because the conventional you know heel toe is not really working for me maybe the guy will come back with some just like new age crazy maybe he hops what if he just like hops on his left leg the whole time <laughs> They find out that skipping is less, you know, like, hard on your leg, and he's just skipping down the fairway. He shows up what about doing something crazy? I think there, there's something in the UFC when they do weigh-ins, when a guy, I think when he, sh- like, strips down naked, and they put the um, the towel in front of him, I think some guys will, like, lean on the towel, pretending that they're just, like, holding the towel up, and they'll push off it a little bit to make their to make weight. I mm-hmm. think there was, like, a big controversy with Daniel Cormier a few years ago or something. What if tiger just leaned on joey the whole time just walking down leaning on joey we've talked about carrying him that's that's not ever gonna happen but if he just walked down the fairway with one arm on joey take a little bit of pressure off that leg well like what if the, he's maybe he gets some you know someone from his learning lab from tg you know one of the one of the graduate students who went to some engineering school and, and start some sort of special competition like divide design some sort of device that Tiger thinks is not a golf cart because he'll never ride a golf cart, but makes it easier for the man to walk. I mean, so th- th- we have enough brain power out there to come up with some sort of contraption for this guy. If I that- were partially, if I were Tiger one, you made a good point, Dan, I would have walking specialists looking at everything to figure out the best way to walk. That doesn't hurt my leg. And two, really dive deep into the PJ tour rule book on like, where's the line? Like, he, you know, he doesn't want to take a cart. What is the most like? What's something with wheels that he could use that would also be within the rules? Yeah, like you know, how some people when they get surgery, they they put like their leg, they kind of bend it and they rest it on a pad and they wheel themselves with the other foot. That's right. What if he did that? That's something I would have. I my hate it all. I want him on a motorcycle. I want him in a golf cart. Whatever he's got to do, he's got to take the motorcycles we took in Myrtle Beach, which I don't know if it's coming out in this episode. It might be the next one. Was that episode? That wasn't the first round you played with us, Danny, right? With the motorcycle one? I think it the, might have been. the motorcycle one was the first round I played with. Oh, you it guys. was. So tonight yeah. we're in those motorcycles that I'm talking about. If you don't tell me, tell me that Tiger Woods shouldn't take this fucking thing rolling down the field in, uh, in, in the Masters. He would be an absolute shoe in for another victory. I still think Healy's are the best option. Fellas, I'd like to talk to you about mortgages. You mind if we do that on this fine Monday afternoon? Let's do it. Please. Every single day I wake up, I'm like, what do I want to think about today? What do I want to be grateful for today? You know, I I get down, I go on my knees, I pray to the gods up above. I want to say thank you, Lord, for, and I got to be honest, I never thought that I'd be including a mortgage company into that into that prayer, that daily prayer saying thanks. But I, I do now. They've, they've, they've entered my rotation of people to be thankful for because I am a cross-country mortgage user. We do all these ads. We have all these sponsors. We have all these partnerships. And it's like, all right, we're pushing product here. We're pushing product there. I legitimately went to a cross-country mortgage uh, person. My guy's name was Chris Devin. And I forgot what his title is. I guess an account manager, owner, whatever. You know what he is, Frankie? He's a friend. He's a friend, He's a friend. at this point. He really He's is a friend. He's got your best interest at heart. That's what's important. And he walked me through. I had many, many 10 p.m. calls with him oh being like, dude. I, you, well, I, actually, let me, let me interrupt you really quick. I want to give a special shout out to Chris Devin because yeah. <laughs> having Frankie Borelli as your customer or your client or whatever you want to call it, I'll get down on my knees and pray. God bless you, Chris Devin, because I'm sure 
you have had many, many, many late night conversations with Frankie about weird things. It's a very stressful process. You, it's scary, but they walk you through it. Cross Country Mortgage listens. They understand and they communicate throughout the entire loan process. When I tell you, not only did he call me, but he would say, Frankie, go to bed. I, see, I hear you. I see you. I would send him all my stuff. I'm like, dude, this is how much I make. This is how much we're going to be able to afford. He's like, go to bed. In the morning, I'm going to send you a write-up, and I'm also going to include a video. And he would take a video of himself at the desk so that you could watch him talking through it. You could see his hand motions. He's a person. You're not just talking to a, 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 a number, a computer. You're not just right. a, a, a data point. Cross-country mortgage are people helping people. They have innovative technology that focuses on what is important to fulfill your loan needs. You can ask, access your equity to use for a larger expenses, for debt consolidation, to home renovation. So it's not just for buying a new home. And who doesn't love free swag? Get a free Barstool and Cross Country Mortgage sweatshirt when you sign up to refi or get a pre-approval right now while supplies last, of course. So make sure you go and do that. The hoodies are awesome. See if you qualify today. Visit ccm.com slash barstool now. That's crosscountrymortgage.com, ccm, ccm.com slash barstool now cross country mortgage llc nmls 30209 all loans subject to underwriting approval www.nmlsconsumeraccess.org you guys see this um we put it on our instagram this this group the scramble group that shot a 46 in a tournament yeah, everyone, starts everyone starts booing everyone starts booing I mean, it's obviously fake, right? Because scrambles have been going on forever, and no one's ever shot a 46. They made a hole-in-one on a 381-yard par-4. They made So they made a hole-in-one on a par-4. They made an albatross, four eagles, and 12 birdies. I mean, come on. Are, are these, like, are they pros, or do we know, like, any it background? It was just at a guys? regular, I don't know. I mean, I don't know that we have much information on them. It was at the Robert Trent Jones golf course on the trail. I don't. I don't understand how this is possible. A lot of people in the comments are saying, like, is it one of those things where you can buy a hole in one? Like sometimes at these <laughs> events, you can legit like pay like a thousand bucks and you get like a one on your card. Yeah. I mean, physically, it makes me want to impossible. see a scramble. It makes me want to see a scramble between Rory, Scotty, JT and Rom. So now I they have, could, have we... I don't think they could shoot a 46. Dep yeah, but I would I'd like to see it. I don't know if have we ever seen four guys four. I mean, it probably wouldn't be that interesting because it would just be birdie after birdie after birdie. But I would like to see what they would shoot. You get the four best players in the world in a scramble format. I don't think we've ever seen that. No. When you they know? do the matches, they don't do two man scrambles, do they? Sometimes they might do like a two man scramble, but I don't. I don't. It, it would be like for six holes, right? Or they do part right. of it. And I don't. We've definitely not seen eighteen holes of a scramble between four of the best golfers in the world. I think they would eagle every par five and birdie every hole for sure. For sure. They would eagle every par five and birdie every other hole? Yeah, I think so. So what would that put them at? So All right, that would so be 22 under par, right? Or Yeah. And then All maybe right, so if we're looking at the top four players in the world right now, you know, according to the world golf rankings, which is a, a thing of much contention right now. So that'd be Very a 50. <clears throat> You've got... You got Rory, you now. got Scotty Scheffler, you got Cameron Smith, and Patrick Cantlay. Cantlay is number four. From what I'm seeing, John Rahm is right behind him. Okay, let's. We're going to sub in Rahm for Cantlay. No disrespect. Am I looking at the right list? Yeah, you are. Right? I know that Cantlay is always way higher in the world rankings. So All right, so yeah, let's do Rory, Scotty, Cam Smith, and John Rahm. What do they shoot in a scramble? I mean, Cam Smith's making every. If you Cam Smith is the anchor putter, getting three reads at every putt. That right. guy's not missing the whole day. But, you know, we play scrambles all the time. There are those scenarios where, yes, you hit the green in two, and these are the best golfers in the world, but if they're playing a course that's equivalent to their distance, they're obviously not hitting – they're not going to be hitting, like, right next to the stick in two, even if you have four tries at it. They're four individual people. Now, are you a shoe-in automatic to make a 25-footer regardless of how many reads you get? I don't know that – it's an automatic eagle on every single one of the par fours, uh, par fives. I think that's a hard thing to like write in. I think they would do it. I guess. What do you think? 
I just like the more we talk about it, the 46 is legitimately impossible. It's one of those groups that came in, they were shit faced, they just wrote whatever they wanted to write. Dude, the video, they're legitimately getting booed. They're getting getting booed. booed. That's the best (laughs) part of the the country. Places like bullshit. Because if you look at the rest of the scores, there's like one in the 50, like two in the 50s, and a bunch of them are in the 60s. So, yes, it probably was an easy course. That is pretty common for a scramble. A lot of good golfers, they go 10 under, they go 15 under. They don't go. I mean, what is that? I don't even know how to do the math on that. Is that 28 under? I mean, that's it's insane. Uh, 26. Yeah. 26 it's under. 22, 26. Par, what a par is. <clears throat> I mean, come on, man. Okay, so let's let's ask the question. We have Rory McIlroy, Scotty Scheffler, Cameron Smith, and John Rahm, and they're playing a scramble at Augusta National. What do they shoot? <laughs> I, I say I say 51. 50. The putting, the putting is still so difficult there. Um, I would be curious with the putting point. I'd be curious, like what would be the furthest they would be from a hole all day after all the approach shots? I don't think it would be that far, because then they know, they know how far it's playing too. Like these guys are so good. Someone's gonna hit a perfect shot. All right, think about twelve. Someone's gonna hit a perfect. Think about shot. twelve. <clears throat> when these guys play twelve individually, are they always just ma- like close enough to make a birdie? That's like. People say it's the hardest par three well, ever. No, because they they're playing. They're playing safe. They're playing to the middle of the green. Someone's going to play the middle of the green. Then other three are going to go right at it. That's where they're going to be better than everybody. Yes. Where the first guy can just they're like just put one on, and it's going to be twenty feet. And, they'll and do then it. the rest of them are going to seek. They're going to be heat seeking missiles at the pin. Yeah, it's not like us where it's like the sometimes the third guy's like, "Yo, we got to hit the screen." <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> See that that's something that I hadn't thought about, but it's so true. Like, yeah, during the Masters, of course, they're going to be like. What can I do to not end up in those bunkers and not end up in the water? I'm just going to throw it middle of the green, and that I just want to get out of here without becoming a viral clip. These guys in the scramble, they're just like, all right, get one on, and then let's go. Let's make it happen. I mean, do you think that would be fun to watch or not? Like, why has that never happened? I guess it would be kind of boring. It's hard to just... get four guys. We can, we have trouble getting one guy in one No, place. I'm not saying. I'm just saying, like, can't. I feel I feel like I would enjoy watching that. Like, Live. They have enough of these. They have enough Live of these will exhibitions. Probably do it. Yeah, Frankie's calling for some some that's, good ideas here. That's the thing when you got a rogue league like that, you can hear a discussion like this on a podcast and be like, "Let's just do that." Because Dude, clearly, live should people absolutely go team scrambles. <laughs> I mean, how dumb are uh, they for not doing that yet? Dude, yeah, like, one event where one event just, of the year, yeah, one event where it's just team scrambles, the fucking flying aces versus the jackhammers, whatever these team names are, and you just you well, just that do is the it. Problem. That is the problem with the team concept is the teams never played against each other as teams. God, like, if, they, if they did a scramble, so cool I would the watch Ryder that. Cup, yeah, like what's so cool about the Ryder Cup is like you got or two guys scrambles, two on two, you know? No, I want but four. They, I want to see how low they can go. Any Anything where you can see one team playing against the other team. The whole like, okay, we're doing a team competition, but really we're just going to count these three scores of these individual. Like that's not a team. That's not a team competition. Here's like, how I know the gonna, scramble like, thing it. is a good idea because when I hear it, I know that I would watch that. Yeah. And I know a lot of people would watch that. And they are, like we talked about earlier in the show, they're hurting for viewers. If you actually want viewers and you don't just want this thing to be like a weird cash, you know, paying for whatever they're trying to pay for. If you actually want people to watch, like Danny's saying, you can't have the team thing not actually be a team thing. The only time we see these teams together is when they all have huge bottles of champagne on stage, which is fucking weird. But if you actually want it to be a team event, Make it a scramble. Do at least one just to yeah. see what happens. Maybe they had like the live crazy open where it's like one day's a scramble. One day's like a one club challenge. You know, all these like YouTube ass things. Like if you imagine if you had a, a tournament where the guys had to play 18 holes with one club, like someone would shoot 68 and it would be people would be super impressed and they would talk about it and watch highlights of them hitting flop shots with eight irons and six iron. You know, I know it doesn't kind of flies in the face of their message of like we're a serious golf competition, but. You got no rules. You got no history to play with. Right. I've often said, um, somewhat jokingly, but somewhat not, that the John Deere Classic should be like a testing ground for new ideas on the PJ Tour. Just like, let's try this. Let's try that. You know, that would be more interesting. And you'll get answers for the questions that you have. Live should be that times a billion. Mm -hmm. It should be a complete testing ground for interesting golf stuff. They basically need to be a YouTube channel. They are a YouTube channel. It's perfect. They, are, it works they perfect. already they are, are a YouTube, YouTube channel. channel. Gosh, so yeah. why not really lean into it and actually be a YouTube Everybody channel? Everybody and their mother has a golf YouTube channel now. It's fucking crazy. It's true. <laughs> Even Greg Norman. Golf has one. Their, their, their advantage is that they have professional golfers signed for 
Yeah, you know, we're like, a couple, hey, watch a this. Bucks. Watch this guy try and break ninety once in a while, and they're <laughs> like, why don't you watch Phil Mickelson try and fucking win a golf tournament on YouTube? It's like, Jesus, all right. Did you better. guys see that uh, Greg Norman is making canned transfusion cocktails? No. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It's called everybody, out everybody's, of our lane, bro. Yeah. Everybody's taking. Everybody's just they're just ramming into our lane, and we're Crazy. you know we're just. We're trying. We're like, we were doing this stuff, and they're like, nope, that's ours now. No, no, it's ours. Yeah, I got tagged in a couple it. comments that were like, hey, this feels a little personal. Well, <laughs> he doesn't know what's hitting him when it comes to the gummy world that we're fucking diving yeah, deep what's into. Yeah, the what's the update on the gimmies? You know, it's 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 ongoing. It's an ongoing. It's on the desk. It's it's a, we had on a the, real meeting about it last week. Full-blown meeting about gimmies. It said gimmies X barstool. We had a guy talk to us on the Zoom. He talked a lot about circling back and stuff. Circling so I, back. Was I, just, I just wasn't at this meeting. Yeah, no. I think you were it probably was, doing something else. I you know. were. I think you were trying to get an interview across the world or something. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You weren't there at the inception of Gimme's. I'm just saying you don't. You don't want to waste your time with Gimme's. You got to be yeah. interviewing Colin Morikawa, not taking Gimme's meetings. I don't know. I feel like I feel like a Gimme's meeting meeting would have been a good one to be at, but it's all right. No, no, we we strategically left you off that one. No, I'm just, I mean it's just something that the guy reached out to us. He wanted to have a meeting, but at the end of the day, it is going, it's moving, it's it's fluid, it's something that's going to happen. Hopefully, we got to see the taste test. If we ever get to that point, will be the best part, no doubt about it. Just that's Trent sitting in diet. an all white room, like I'm picturing the Willy Wonka room where he walks them all in, and it's like we're going to show you the new go- the everlasting gobstopper, and Trent's sitting down, and you just feed him. A bunch of fucking Oompa Loompas walk over and just feed Trent. Oh my god, man! We have to make that happen tomorrow. Yeah, that'd tomorrow. be a good, a good YouTube I mean, video. Like I, I talked about how I'm on this diet, but I'll if you guys want to shove a bunch of candy in my we'll face, be the Oompa Loompas. Like, we'll do the dance. We'll come down. Oompa <laughs> Loompa, doopa dee dee. I like it. Oh, fuck. I got to go answer the door for these guys. They're probably sitting on my porch right now. I, t- I said that 20 minutes ago. I got a, a Simply Safe notification at like 12.58 that there was a guy outside. It's, it's 117 right now. So just, that's just tell them I got to go had to do with. an interview. Just tell All right. Danny so an interview. we've got Harris English on the show. Uh, Danny, you were there for it. You and Riggs did yes. it. Uh, Frankie and I were doing Tillery stuff. So yeah. um, you, what, do you, what do you got to say about it? Yeah, Harris has been one of my favorite guys on tour for a little while. He's just really quiet. Like, he's not going to, you know, he doesn't, I don't think he's on social media at all. Not not one for self-promotion, but really, really cool dude. A like, very, very popular guy out on the PJ Tour. He's part of the, the Sea Island Mafia, which is growing f- rapidly. Sea Island is, you know, given Jupiter and Scottsdale and Dallas a run for its money. Like, everyone's, everyone's moving to Sea Island. Georgia Bulldog. I believe that's where Zach Johnson lives. That would sound correct. Yeah, there's a ton of St. Simons Island, like that area in Georgia. Yeah. They're all they're all down there. Uh, he's a Georgia Bulldog, so Georgia boy through and through. Played on the 2021 Ryder Cup team, uh, which which is pretty damn cool because that team, you know, as we look in hindsight, is is one of the better teams that's ever been assembled. So we talked a lot about that week. We talked about his injury. We talked about college football. We talked about the QBE shootout. Him and Matt Kuchar are like an absolute problem at the QBE. They win it like basically every year. Um, so it was nice nice to catch up with Harris for sure. Awesome. Uh, anybody got anything else before we throw it to Harris? I just got tagged in something that says, this will make you hallucinate. And you just kind of look into Click. this. And then I did it. And then when you look up, it's fucking wild, man. It's amazing what can happen when you manipulate your eyes. And you look at one of those things and you just stare in the middle of the dot. All right, everybody. Enjoy Harris. <laughs> We got Harris English here. This is kind of how we do the show. We just jump in. We don't really, we're not particularly formal group. Um, QB shootout. You've won this puppy before, sort of in the um, the couple months. I feel like when a lot of guys are taking off or they're you know a little bit more free time and whatnot. What's this? What's the shootout kind of vibe and and event all about? And it's it's a lot of fun. I, I love playing team golf. Um, it was a weird story of kind of how I got in the tournament. Years ago, I I won twice in 2013, and my partner, the the last number of years, uh, Matt Kuchar, was supposed to play with Brant Snedeker, and then Brant got hurt a couple weeks before the QB shootout, and then Kuch called me. We were buddies here on St. Simons, and I was obviously playing really well at the time, and called me to to fill in for him, and I think we won that year by like eight or nine shots. 
So we went down and dominated. And ever since then, we've, we've been playing a good bit. I think we've won it three times um, in the last number of years. So it's, it's just a fun, a fun tournament, a fun vibe. Get to go down to Naples. And it's, it's way more relaxed than a normal tournament is. Um, you get to play scramble. You play uh, modified alternate shot and best ball. Like formats, we, we never really get to play. Um, really good weather down there. I mean, there's only, I think, 12 teams. So it's a very intimate group. And there's a lot of parties and a, and a lot of functions we do. And it's just a lot of fun. I, I, love, I love playing in that tournament. It doesn't feel like work for me. It, it, everybody prepares a little bit, but it's not like a, a big grind week down there. And um, obviously playing with Cooch, he's, he's a lot of fun and um, a great partner. I mean, he's super solid. And um, we've had a lot of success. So keep going he's back. Solid. I'm gonna guess it's no longer yeah. called the Shark Shootout. They they removed the shark from all that stuff. I think it's yeah, the, yeah. the Sharkless Shootout this year. I don't I don't know if Greg's showing up this year. Was Greg? Well, because I remember last year when they they did the broadcast. I'm like, I think he was there. Was was that like the most awkward thing of all time last year when he was hosting an event that was part of the PGA Tour while simultaneously trying to basically destroy the PGA Tour? Yeah, it was weird. I I really didn't know all that stuff was going on at the time of this tournament last year. I mean, he does a big uh, big banquet one night, raising a bunch of money for for uh, cancer and all that. Um, but Greg's been great. I mean, I I've, I actually played with him. He was he was partners with Jonas Blix. I think my first year and Cooch and I were paired with him, and he was great. I mean, he was super nice and fun. And uh, I've heard a lot of people have kind of mixed opinions of him, but from the time I've spent with him, he's he's been great. But yeah, I think they uh, nixed him off the, the the host in the tournament. I, I don't know who they're going to get. Sometimes they get Brett Bear. Um, who knows who they'll have this year. They. Uh, it's funny because we had, God, maybe four years ago or something, we had Craig Norman came into the office, and he did like a full hour with us. We sat down in studio and did podcasts. And outside of maybe like Butch Harmon, it was maybe the best podcast interview we ever did. He was telling stories about him and Bill Clinton and drinking, and he was just, <laughs> he was awesome. And he had this star power, too, when he came in. Like, there's certain, and we were kind of talking about Barstool earlier, you know, like A-Rod comes through, and like there's big names that have come through that office, and it used to be a way smaller office when we did this. And Greg Norman was one of those guys that walked in, and people that weren't even, you know, we have uh, a lot of young content creators at barstool especially four years ago or three years ago whatever it was they have no fucking idea who greg norman was and even they were just like that guy's a star i don't know i don't know anything else i just know that guy's kind of a star so it's wild for us now to like greg norman is public enemy number one in a lot of circles in a lot of places <laughs> because he was a phenomenal interview when he came in and we were raving for weeks we were like how about that greg norman interview and now it's like if i even see his merchandise in a pro shop like the shark thing i'm like oh i can't believe i have that there that's what they say when Harris English walks into a room. They're like, you know, I don't know who this guy is, but that guy is a celebrity superstar. <laughs> I don't know about that. I don't know about that. Um, Greg definitely has an entrance. Like every year, I mean, I don't know how long he, how far he lives away from Naples. It can't be more than like an hour or two, but he would always bring his helicopter in and oh, land yeah. on 18 Fair when you got pine straw blowing everywhere. It's like, you know, Greg, Greg Norman's here and he flies in, does a trophy presentation and gets in his helicopter and rolls back and it's just like man that's that's pretty sick that guy just brings in his helicopter for like a hour and a half drive but it is an interesting like conversation though because you know we all exist in this golf world where we all kind of know the same people right or or you hear the opinions about one person from a lot like you know this player has a reputation but there's a certain you know saying norman everything everyone's been talking about how you like axe to grind whatever but at a certain level you can kind of only judge people by the way that they've treated you in a certain way and i'm sure that you've had this experience Riggs and harris and i have where you know you meet someone where you're told like oh, this guy's a dick or this guy's difficult and you're like eh, i kind of like that guy and you just don't really know how to sit with those two things do we do it on this podcast all the fucking time we have yeah. I mean, we've shit on people publicly made fun of them everything they do and then we have them on the show like a bubba watson or like patrick reed we've been chatting and we were like oh yeah guy's super nice i'm sure if i did that with stan cranky i'd be like oh yeah big fan of stan yeah it's like yeah. Yeah. I mean, that that's the relationship I have with Greg. I mean, it was, he, he even was on the first tee of the Ryder cup behind the first tee this year. And I, I thought that was kind of weird him being an Aussie guy and more of a president's cup guy. And there he is when we're about to tee off in the Ryder cup, he was behind the first tee and I said, hello. But again, that was before I kind of knew all this stuff was going down. I mean, I had heard rumors for years about 
them trying to start another tour and all that, but I had no idea Greg was kind of behind all this. Yeah. What's it, um, what's it been like for you this year with everything going on, just trying to cut through the noise, play golf? Have you been tuning in? Are you like reading the articles? You got group texts going on with some guys on tour that are sending shit around like, oh, did you hear this? What's kind of your relationship been to everything? Yeah, I, I definitely read a lot. I, I definitely have tuned into some of their broadcasts um, just to see what it's about. Um, and it's it's kind of been different here that uh, a St. Simons guy, one of my best friends, um, Hudson Swafford, went to live. So um, it, it's been kind of weird um, having having him go there and, and then we're on the tour. And it's just it's just been different. But I every week on the range, every week in the locker room, people are talking about it different rumors of who's going, who's not going, all the money that's been thrown around. So it's definitely been a, a hot topic on tour, and I don't really see it slowing down in the in the next few months. Yeah, Hudson's kind of the guy that everyone says that you look like. So it's nice that you don't have him in the mix anymore. No one's going to get you two mixed up. But that is an interesting angle that we don't, you know, what, what is it? That's one of your best friends, right? So do you feel conflicted? Do you Has nothing changed between you guys? I mean, it'd be like, I guess, if one of my best friends, you know, left, barstool and went to go to another company that was trying to destroy barstool like i think that would probably impact our friendship yeah it definitely has been weird i i like a lot of the guys who have gone to live like i i stayed in a house with a answer at tiger's tournament down at the hero last year like we're great friends i mean he was playing with my dog like hanging out with my wife like we're we're great friends and i i don't it's not like i don't hate those guys I, i'm i'm fine with the guys that go to live and don't try to take down the pga tour i just didn't really like the lawsuit uh, of all those guys' names on the lawsuit trying to hurt the PGA Tour. I'm I'm cool with guys going and just go and make your money and do whatever, but don't try to hurt us or hurt how we've built our brand or legacy and, and try to impact the way we make money. That seemed to be the tipping point for sure. And uh, I, I don't – it's just weird. Um, I mean, those guys kind of knew what was coming – when when they went to live, they knew what they were giving up. They knew potentially they couldn't get world ranking points, potentially not play in a Ryder Cup President's Cup, and pretty sure you can't come back on the PJ Tour and play ever again. So they, they knew what they were giving up. They got paid a lot of money to do that. And for me, it's like you kind of knew what you're getting into. So don't so don't then say, hey, like, nah, we're we're the we're we're not the problem here. We we need to play on the PJ Tour and you can't really have your cake and eat it too. I mean you can't take all this money promote the live tour and then come back and play the pga tour when you're trying to hurt our brand right totally yeah i uh i'm curious too if there's any uh living in a, in a place where there are you know folks from different sides is there any like bad blood is there any is it awkward at all or is it if you see guys that are you know live or that have said certain things do you just not do you really not care like yeah is, is it weird uh, it, it is weird. I, I wouldn't say there's any bad blood. I mean, my, my coach, Justin Parsons, works with uh, Louis Ustase and, and Brandon Grace, um, who are on the live tour. And, and Brandon actually came up here a few months ago and, and stayed at Sea Island and worked with him. So I went and had lunch with him, sat down with him. And we kind of we talked about some stuff and I'm, I'm cool with it. I mean, he has different opinions than I do, but he also grew up in South Africa. So his view of the PGA Tour is not the same that I have of growing up in Georgia. All, all I wanted to do is to be like Davis Love or Freddie Couples and play on the PJ Tour, win on the PJ Tour and all that. And I get it from their perspective is they didn't really have a tour. They had the South African Tour, the Sunshine Tour, they had the European Tour, and a PJ Tour is just kind of this other tour. And that that's kind of how they view it. They have no allegiance to one tour or another. And I kind of get I get it. And Gracie is one of the guys who doesn't really want to bring down the PJ Tour. Neither does Louis. I mean, Louis probably wants to play golf for a few more years, try to win some majors, and kind of ride off into the sunset. Um, but I, I get it. I get it from some of those guys. Every everybody, this is an individual sport. Everybody has to do what's best for them and their family. Just don't try to hurt your competitors or, or guys that you've played with for the past 10 or 12 years. Don't, don't try to impact how they make money or, or their legacy or their brand. Yep. I think that's, that makes, again, we've heard a ton of players who have said the same thing where it's like, once yeah, they it's, turned it's, around and sued us. Totally. That's just the difference. Like, yeah, go do your thing. I get it. You made your decision. I'm going to make mine. The second that the, they jumped on the lawsuit, that was a mistake. I, I still, I can't believe certain guys did well, that. Well, they've all backed off. Um, 
They've all been like, oh, yeah, I didn't. So it's like, yeah, yeah. Clearly they figured it out eventually, but you're still going to be remembered. You know, that made it, that made it like, Kyle, everything's fine. Good to see you. I hope you're good on live to like, fuck you a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, it I, almost, I actually it don't know asked. if it was like as nefarious as, I think it's like more live was like, we'll pay for your legal fees. You know, like we'll, we'll sue them and we'll, and we'll pay and you don't really have to do anything. And if we win, you'll get way more money. And some of these guys are probably like, okay, I think that sounds good to me. I just, I just I don't think know that's if right. these, but yeah, I, I just don't but know I if think these guys the way are. It's perceived is way more. You know, it's just it just became personal. Totally. It was looking, but w- with the live stuff, one thing that is clear is that that 2020 Ryder Cup team will never be together again, like it was. You were on that team. Are are you looking back at that and the absolute beatdown that you guys laid on them? And that's an all time team. That, that, that we could be looking at that team and like not, you know as like a dream team situation, especially if the lift stuff really does split everybody up. What are your memories from that week and that team? And do you look back on that and just think oh, I was on one of the greatest teams of all time? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I've had a lot of time for reflection of that, especially when I had surgery in February for my hip and was out a few months. But yeah, I mean, we we never we might never see a, a true Ryder cup again of the best guys in Europe versus the best guys in the U S or there could be this split now forever. And it, it really sucks. But, but to be on that team, what well, was incredible. I was, I was very lucky to be a captain's pick. I, I played some really good golf and obviously playing for captain Stricker was incredible and having some of my idols with Davis love, Freddie, um, being some of the co-captains, Zach Johnson. I mean, it, it was incredible. And, um, that beat down and we, we kind of knew it was going to happen. I mean, we had a lot of confidence and obviously, I mean, Dustin, Colin, the Shambo Brooks, I mean, Spieth, JT, I mean, it, it was stacked. I mean, we had Scotty like, before Scotty was Scotty too. That's almost exactly. my favorite part is like, it's almost like if the, if the dream team took Christian Leitner and then the next year, Christian Leitner was just like MVP of the league. Yeah. And, and people were kind of hating on Scotty being a captain spec. And people didn't realize how good he was. And he was just on the cusp of playing unbelievable golf, which he did this past year. And people were like, oh, I mean, him him waxing John Robb in the singles just kind of showed how good this kid is and, and how much how much he has to go in this game. And and it's really cool for him to validate that pick with, with how well he played this past year. And you got a lot of young, hungry guys and, and guys that didn't really have all this baggage of losing a lot of Ryder Cups. Um, kind of all this negative stuff attached to the Ryder Cup. You had all these fresh guys in there who were ready to try to whip somebody's ass. Yeah, I think the attitude shift was big because we, you know, we just spoke to Webb Simpson earlier and no and there's no disrespect to Webb Simpson and there's no disrespect to Zach Johnson and these guys, you know, Jim Furyk, Steve Stricker, these guys who had all what that people baggage. say before they're about to disrespect somebody. Yeah, for, for but like those guys were time. those guys were so nice. They were so nice, right? And they lost a lot and and that left scar tissue and then you got guys like Colin who are just like, I'm going to absolutely crush these guys because I've won every level of my golf career, and why will this be any different? And you guys had that edge. Yeah, yeah, it was it was really cool to see, and you could feel it in the team room of, of Strick just kind of letting this go. There was no these rah-rah speeches. There was no, like, any of this stuff going on. He's like, you are the best players in the world. We believe in you. Go play your game and just go dominate them. And even that people ask me on that, Saturday night before the final round, I, I can't remember how many points we're leading. They're like, go beat them by more. Like we're not holding on to a lead. Like go, go set records. Go, go, just absolutely demolish them, and everybody win their match, and we'll have a big party on Sunday night, and and everybody, everything will be great. It's exactly what happened. Trent, Daddy, you got a luscious lock of hair, don't you? I actually just got it cut. Where'd you go? Sport clips. Wow, didn't you ever? I love sport clips. They have a bunch of sport clips here on Long Island, and they just are the leaders in men's haircuts. Aren't? Wouldn't you say so? I would absolutely say that. I go in there, they sit me down, they give me a nice haircut. I'm I'm an easy one, but they, I mean they can do any hairstyle that you got. I'm an easy one. You buzz cut it, you throw a eucalyptus towel on my face, and I'm good. You wouldn't play. T- you wouldn't pay a tennis instructor to improve your putting game, now would you, Danny? I would, I would literally never do that. Like, <laughs> no, Tiger with a, go, like Tiger with a golf cart, I would never do that. <laughs> no, you'd go straight to an expert. So why would you go and get your hair cut by someone not trained in men's hair? The stylists at Sport Clips have you covered. They're specifically trained to deal with a guy's hair so you can sit down in the chair with confidence. And while you go to a Sports Clips, 
Once you go to a Sport Clips, you have to ask for the MVP experience. It comes with a hot steam towel infused with a blend of essential oils. Uh. You can go lavender, chamomile, eucalyptus, all especially formulated for your relaxation. Sport Clips is the pro in men's hair, so you got to go try it out. Go to Sport Clips. You can look like Trent Daddy. This this read is rated R, so you can be sexy as fuck like Trent Ryan. You can go to a Sport Clips. You can walk out of there, and there's going to be floods happening. You're, the women around you are going to be like, where did you get those hairs cut? Gas me you're up, you're going to say, I went to Sport Clips. My name is Trent Ryan. You see these hairs? They used to be fucking bigger. They used to be longer, and now they're tight. You know, now they're tight and firm. These oh hairs are God. tight and firm. Trent, oh my God, Trent, really where'd you go? Good. They really let you do R on this one. Where, I'm into it. Where'd you go, Trent? I went to Sport Clips. That's where I went. Uh, talk to me about Freddy. How great is Freddy? Freddy's unbelievable. Um, he's one of the guys that I was kind of nervous about meeting. I actually, uh, gotten to play with him a couple times but he's he's super chill fun relaxed like he he's a guy who if he senses anybody being nervous or anxious or anything he's gonna come over rub their shoulders tell them a joke he's just the guy who gets everybody where they need to be and in the right mindset and he's one of the most chill fun easygoing guys i've ever been around um no bullshit kind of Go play your game. I mean, he he's incredible. He he's one of my favorite guys, and he he's master of that team room. Um, not just being a, a captain and like telling you like play play it here. This putt goes this way. He's just a, good for the vibe, and and that's what we had that week is a lot of different personalities in that room. But but he kind of seems to bring everybody together and and get everybody laughing and and super relaxed. Just heard nothing but good things about Freddie. Everybody, yeah, that guy's got smiling. the best reputation there is. Everybody smiles when they hear it, when everybody brings him up. It's it's just nice to see. I um, I also one of my one of my first things that pops into my mind when I think Harris English is the marathon playoff that you were in. Oh, I was last there year or a couple I was years there. ago for, at the Travelers Championship. It was like what was it, eight holes or something like that? Seven holes. They played the same one over and over again. And we played 17 a couple times, maybe once. But you played eight. No, yeah. didn't they not play 18 like four times in a row? We did, yeah. Yeah. yeah it was, uh, it was incredible. I mean, I've, I've played with Kramer since then and we've had some good laughs about it. But it's kind of one of those situations where nobody backed down. I mean, we were both making those knee knocker putts six, eight, 10 feet to keep it going and uh really one of the the cool things that not many people know about is finishing in regulation i made a, a big putt I, I finished a couple groups ahead of kramer and i think bubba was coming down the stretch too he had a chance to win but he making that putt on 18 there. i, I, I feel like bubba loves that place he does he, he plays well i guess he won't be playing there yeah, anytime played. soon <laughs> played um <laughs> but i was playing with jason day i was paired with him in the last round i made that big putt on 18 which i thought to win the tournament or at least get in the playoff. And I mean, he's, he's been in those situations before. I mean, he's not that much older than me, but um, he had some great advice for me. We're in the, in, in the locker room or, or the clubhouse signing our scorecard. And he was like, Hey, Hey mate, uh, I would, I would be ready for a playoff. Um, go chip, go hit balls, be ready for it. Cause anything can happen. I, I thought that was really cool for him to give me that advice because I'm, on a high, just making a huge putt on 18 in that amphitheater of golf. And um, it, it's kind of weird. Like, you don't really know what to do after that. You, I don't know. Some people might go inside and watch the golf, chill out for a little bit. But I just went straight to the range, hit balls, and and kind of listened. I can't remember who was there telling us what, what was going on, but kind of listening to the roars and, and being ready for anything. And I, I felt like I was very prepared going to 18T, I had no letdown. I was I was still up. I was ready to go for for anything, and that that really helped me in the, in the playoff. That's a really cool move from Jason Day. That's you put a pretty good little uh, Australian accent you put on there too. Yeah, that was that's, nice. That's all, that's all I got. Yeah. That's a good little flair you added there. The um the Travelers is the, to the northeast, and and you know I lived up in the northeast forever. Dan's up there now, like that. So that tournament 
and how big it's become and how much the players have embraced it over the last handful of years means so much to people up there in Connecticut and just the whole Northeast. So that amphitheater, I love how much drama there's been there with the speed shot, with your guys' marathon of a playoff, because uh, that amphitheater is one of the coolest ones in golf. It's a hell of a tournament. Yeah, yeah it, it's awesome. And, and for us as players, like you can feel the energy from the crowd. I mean, Wednesday Pro-Am, I've never seen so many people at a Wednesday Pro-Am like when you're teeing off number one um they just love the tournament and it's awesome for us to to feel feel loved up there and and they love to come out and watch golf um but but really that that closing stretch i mean that whole back nine i mean you can go shoot 40 or you can go shoot 29 and it can change the whole tournament and that, and that's really cool with the drop pool par par four number 15 anything can happen on 17 18 um it's just a really cool finish and and you won't hear any player say a negative thing about that tournament or, or that course, TPC River Highlands. I and mean, it's, it's one of our favorites of the year. Is it, is it one of the elevated events next year? I think it is. I think, I think it, it is. is. You're, you're I think it see, is. You might be in that one. You're going to see McElroy. You're going to see all the big names, which will, I mean, hopefully more and more people will come out and we'll have some more drama on 18, but it's, how are you, it's really cool that that, that tournament gets rewarded it. with the, yeah how how are you feeling about the new the new schedule because you're you're kind of cusp right i mean this year you probably won't make the pip top 20 because you you were hurt and stuff i know those are the guys who are in in all the events like do you have any idea how it's going to work are they telling you guys like here's what the eligibility is going to be like here's what you're allowed to play i think a lot of those tournaments um they have a category of past rider cup or the or the previous rider cup inside you're locked in those um It'll be interesting to see because we've we've kind of tried that with the World Golf Championships years ago, and uh, it didn't really work out. I mean, Akron, Ohio, Bridgestone, great tournament, but if Tiger wasn't playing, nobody really watched it. I, I know that's right. a lot of tournaments, but we'll see how it works out. I mean, they're they're guaranteed all these big big fields. I mean, I was I was talking to Chance Cosby who runs the. Uh, the Phoenix tournament, the waste management Phoenix open, and, and they already get a, a really good field. So they're mm -hmm. really only by being elevated. They're only adding four or five big names. I mean, McElroy is never going to play there unless it's elevated. So we'll, we'll see. I mean, playing for $20 million is awesome. Um, <laughs> and and being in those tournaments is awesome. But if you're kind of on the outside looking in, you're like, man, these guys are playing for a lot of money and I'm, I'm sitting at home and playing on PGA tour B team. Yeah two tours it really is going to be kind of two tours going forward yeah um but it, it just again our our sport the pga tour is based on merit so if i wasn't in those tournaments like hey you got to play better you got to work harder you got to play better because this this tour is getting harder and harder to compete on you got all these guys coming out of college coming up the ranks and um it is getting harder but it's gonna I'm just going to have to work harder and, and get better to, to get in these tournaments and to compete where I want to compete. Hit me with the most nervous you've ever been over a golf ball. Mm. You always kind of get nervous coming down the stretch of, of big tournaments, but it's a, a different kind of nervous. Like it's a adrenaline, adrenaline rush. You're really only focused on what you're doing. Um, but man, the Ryder cup this year, I, I didn't play in the first I guess it was Friday morning. I, I wasn't in the first wave alternate shot. So I, I went out there to the tee with, with Bryson and, and Tony and just to get a feel for it of I've never teed off the first tee in, the, in front of this many people in this kind of atmosphere. So I wanted to get a feel for it to hopefully help me out when I was teeing off that afternoon and God, walking out there with Tony and you do all, you do the pictures, they do the announcements and all that. And, and really like all that's going through my mind is like, I've, I just want to get this golf ball on the tee the first try. If I can do that, swing as hard as I can with the driver and just kind of aim aim at something, swing as hard as I can, and wherever it goes, it goes. But if I was if I was going to struggle with getting the ball on the tee, then it was going to be a big problem because your your hands are shaking. Yeah, you just I, it, it's just a different a different feeling playing for somebody, playing for my man Tony, playing for. Captain Stricker playing for the team, playing for the country. I mean, there, there's so much more on your shoulders than just yourself. Like if I'm playing in the Masters or in the British Open, teeing off the first hole, like it's it's on me. Like if I hit a bad shot, that's on me. I can deal with it. But if I if I hit a bad shot for Tony or, or for my team or 
wet down the country, then that's that's uh, a lot more going through your head. So I, I knew if I get that ball in the first tee, the, the first try, I was going to be fine. Did you do it? And where did you hit the tee shot? I, I did. I got it on the tee, and then I just ripped the driver. I mean, that was probably the best shot I hit all day. Is just oh, absolutely so it was down the middle. It. Yeah. Just try that more often. Get nervous more often. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it definitely heightens your awareness of, of what you're doing and, and doing it over and over again. You just kind of know how your body reacts. And, and for me, it's the swing really hard. And if I get nervous or I get in those situations, I usually club down and just swing as hard as I can. I got one question wow. for you that is probably that not me. that much fun to answer. But we talked we, we talked before for another project I was working on about your slump and about how, you know, you, you went all the way down to 300 in the world. This recent it was different, right? You were injured. Does having that scar tissue help you think or hurt when you're, when you're making a comeback like this, having known that you've seen the depths and that you've come back when you have to take time away from the game, is there ever a, a voice creeping in your head? That's like, am I going to go down there again? It, it definitely, the scar tissue definitely helps because um, the coach I work with now, we, we kind of know what to not do and, and kind of the, the spiral I went to with, with different swing thoughts, really a tournament I'd, I'd have a different swing thought for every day sometimes it worked for nine holes sometimes it worked for six holes you just had no idea so I, I know what not to do now and and you just kind of stick to a plan I, I this is my I think coming up on my 12th year playing the PGA Tour so I kind of have a good blueprint of, of what works for me and I feel like we just stick to that I mean golf is definitely going to be some ups and downs throughout the year but I, I kind of know that and, and not to kind of spiral down changing changing a lot of stuff changing a lot of swing stuff i mean i i kind of know what to do now um and i'm i'm 33 now i'm not getting any younger working on my body more um to just be fresh for every tournament because the the seasons get long and and you have aches and pains throughout the year but i i kind of know how to keep that at bay and and i feel like a more well-rounded golfer now i can lean on my short game more um my, my putting has been really solid the last few years. So I, I, I kind of know what to do and, and know if I'm going down the wrong alley to, to bring it back quickly. I, uh, man, I, I, I feel like we were just talking with, uh, like Dan said, with Webb Simpson. He was talking a lot about swing changes and chasing distance and how that eventually uh, led him to actually just trying to get mostly back to where he was before he tried to change some things. Uh, how, how, how difficult is that cycle of chasing something, whether it might not be distance, but chasing kind of perfection and then it not working out and then wishing or trying as hard as you can to just like get back to what you know you've done extremely well before? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're all perfectionists. I mean, that's the crazy thing about this game is you can always get better in every aspect. I mean, I, I just finished the RSM this week and kind of writing down some things of what I need to work on for QBE, what I need to work on to get ready for next year. And you can always get better at something. And it's like playing a practice round with Rory McIlroy. Like, he drives the shit out of the ball. He, he hits it further than me, hits it straighter than me. So for me to try to drive it like Rory McIlroy could mess up some of the parts of the game that I'm really good at, of being a good iron player, working the ball both ways. So that's, that's kind of where – I kind of spiraled down and, and got in the slump of you, you go up and down the range and like these guys do something better than me, but that's what makes me, me. And I've done this since I was a kid and you just got to figure out what you do and how you play the game and just get better at that. It's uh, it's so easy to just look at other people and like, I want to drive it like Dustin Johnson. I want to have the same mental game that Dustin Johnson has, who seems like he doesn't care at all if he makes a triple or an Eagle, but it, it's hard to do that. Um, so yeah, you, you always want to get better at something and, and it's just little things here and there. I mean, a lot of guys recently, I, I know Rory talked about this is trying to get longer. I mean, Bryson kind of changed the the distance game of trying to hit it 350 and gouge it out of the rough and, and some guys can do it and it not have any effect on their other parts of the game. And, and some guys, it, it really hurts them. Um, and I, I know somebody like Webb who as another player looking at Webb's game is like, he's never going to be a, a super long hitter. Webb is a great grinder, really good iron player and just figures it out. He, he can, he can shoot 65 on any golf course and, and kind of pull the rabbit out of the hat of getting up and down, pulling out chips, making 40 footers. I mean, 
that's his game. So for him to chase distance could could hurt some of those factors. And yeah, it's <clears throat> you're always just trying to nitpick little stuff and then get better here and there. But it's good to have a good team around you. I'm, I'm have a really good relationship with my coach Justin Parsons, and he kind of keeps me at at bay of like this is your blueprint. This is you got to stick to this, and it, it, you're kind of here for the long haul. It's it's short term goals short-term visions can kind of i don't know hinder it you takes, a little bit. it takes patience though it, i mean i think golf a golf career takes takes a certain patience that maybe a football or a basketball career doesn't take because you know your window is longer and you also know that being impatient can have serious um drawbacks like in, if you're you know a fringe player in the nfl like you got to get yours you got to do everything you can right now right now right now and webb was telling us that he thinks that the distance thing worked. Like that's why he won the scoring trophy or whatever title he won in 2020. And he was telling us that he wasn't able to carry these bunkers at waste management. But he said for the long haul, it got him to some really bad habits. And it's now been two years where he's been trying to find it. It's just an interesting dynamic. You're 33 now where it feels like you've been doing this forever. You still have another 12 years to go. Like you just got to kind of be patient. Yeah. And, and that's what my coach tells me all the time is like when you're working on stuff, you're not going to have that instant gratification. I mean, it, it could it could show up in three months. It could show up on six months. But what you're working on, you you want to be able to do coming down the stretch on 18 in a big tournament. Um, and, yeah, I mean, I, I've never been a, a short hitter. I mean, I, I think my first year on tour, I was probably top 15 in driving distance. Then everybody else kind of got longer, and I've kind of stayed the same um, right around 300 yards. So I, I've never really had to chase distance. I've, I'm more – I'd, I'd love to hit it dead dead down the middle every time and, and take my 300 yards and Rory hits it 15 or 20 yards past me. That's fine. I, I feel like I can still hit an eight iron maybe as close as you can a pitching wedge. Um, but yeah, some of the some of the shorter hitters. I mean, you you saw kind of coming down the stretch with RSM like Brian Harmon is not a long hitter by any means, but he is a, a crafty player. He he's got all the shots. So he it's not like him hitting at 290 off the tee is, is really affecting the way that he can attack a golf course. So earlier in the show, I talked about how I forgot my credit card at a, at a um, restaurant and I'm still just so lazy to go and get it. I'm so nervous about having to like cancel that card when I thought I lost it. It's like all these things. I'm not good at canceling stuff. I'm really, I have anxiety about it. When I have a bunch of subscriptions, I just can't even think about going in there, remembering my password. You got to sign up. You got to email them. When, when, when a subscription service, it makes you email them and ask them to cancel the subscription service. They make oh, it so hard. Oh my God. So that's why, and I'm not even kidding you guys with this. I legitimately use Rocket Money, formerly known as Truebill, to help me with all of these canceling of subscriptions and see where my money is going and how it's doing. The app shows you all of your subscriptions in one place and cancels what you don't want for you. Rocket Money can even find subscriptions that you don't even know you were paying for. That's a nightmare. If you didn't have this and you were just paying for things for years, I mean, you can't. Well, be this is going to be really helpful for me because I talked about on the show about how my debit card's about to run out and I don't know where all my subscriptions are that I'm going to have to change my new credit or debit card to. I forgot that I have Rocket Money and they're all on a list on my phone. And you I may love, even. Sorry, what was that day? Um, I love Rocket Money because it's forced me to have a tough conversation with myself, which is I order in food way too often. It's it's rich, it, brother. It adds up, at, man. It adds up. You look up. at grocery. You look at what you spend on groceries in a month, and then you look at what you spend on Uber Eats in your month on, in a month, and it's disgusting. And you, someone so needs bad. to be that voice of reason, and Rocket Money will be that. For you, you may even find out that you've been double charged for a subscription, which is also a nightmare. These guys, these scumbags out there, are trying to get you double time for the same subscription. So Rocket Money can find that. They can cancel a subscription. All you have to do as the user of Rocket Money is press the word cancel, and Rocket Money does the rest. Cancel unnecessary subscriptions with Rocket Money today. Go to rocketmoney.com slash four, F-O-R-E. Seriously, it could be saving you hundreds per year. That's rocketmoney.com slash four. Do you guys have just like the most epic weekend games? Because St. Saint, Saint Simons is like sneaking up on uh, on Dallas and Jupiter and Arizona is like one of the places where to PJ. So like, what's your, what's your guys game that you play? Who's in rotation? 
And we, we do, we have, uh, we have a lot of young guys, which is a lot of fun, which, which keeps it fresh. Um, you got like Will Gordon just moved here. John Augustine, who was a really good college player, Vandy, um, Bryson Nimmer, who played this past week, um, Davis Thompson. See, you got all these young, really young, hungry guys that are, are coming up and it's, it's, it's fun for us. Cause to me, it pushes me to, to get better of like, I got to, these guys are trying to take my job, so I gotta, I gotta beat them. Um, they probably but, want to play all the time too. I could see them just wanting to play. They, all they do. They they play a lot more than I do. I I kind of go in spurts of when I'm at home. I'm I'm kind of practicing. I'm kind of resting, doing doing my drills and stuff. And um, you got a guy like Patton Kazire who will play every single day. Loves to play for money. Um, I'll do that some, but it yeah, it, it's it's a lot of fun. We got a lot of good games, a lot of good courses here to play and. Um, it's fun to have those young guys here kind of, kind of pushing me and, and pushing other guys to get better, because if I'm going to be on the PJ tour for 12 or 15 more years, these are, got, these are the guys I got to compete with and, and beat. I've never been down there. You've been down there, Dan? I have not. No, I've no, I've never been to Hilton Head. I've never been to Saints. I got to do like that area of the country. I haven't done any of that. Been to Kiowa. Know, get down there. Yeah. I've been to Kiowa for the tournament, but otherwise, no, it seems awesome. It seems incredible. Yeah, it, it's awesome. It's a it's a small place, but um, it, what's cool about it is there's so many golfers here that you you go to all these restaurants, or whatever, and people kind of know who you are, and they're like, oh, it's just another golfer or whatever. Like, uh, I'm sure these other cities, like you go in and people hound you, but we go to courses and all that, and people are like, oh, we, we saw Harris last week, we saw Patton last week, like these are just normal guys. Um, so it's, it's a really cool place. I moved down here right after I graduated from Georgia and it's, it's been amazing. Um, cause a lot of my college teammates moved down here and it's just been a really easy transition and, and a great place to come back to when you've been on the road for three or four weeks. Have you ever Georgia, resided outside uh, the state of Georgia? So I went to high school in Chattanooga, Tennessee at, uh, at Baylor for Isn't that like right on the border, right on the border. Mm -hmm, um, okay. so that's it. Grew up, grew up in Moultrie, Georgia, went there for four years and went to Athens and came back here. So I'm, uh, I'm a Georgia boy through and through. You're a Georgia boy. Football team's not bad. So yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, they're okay. Man, a lot of, a lot of stuff going on this past weekend. It was, it was kind of nice oh. seeing Tennessee, Tennessee go down, but. That was really the only team I didn't want to play in the playoff because I feel like if we played them again, they have a really good chance of, at beating us. But um, I already, already booked my – I don't know if it's – I don't want to jinx it, but I already, already booked, my, uh, <laughs> booked my hotel in L.A. And in case we make the national championship, I'm going to go to national championship and then fly out the next day to go to the Sony Open. But uh, yeah. it was an Indy last year, and we all watched it together at uh, – and Honolulu, so I didn't, I didn't want to miss another national championship opportunity. Are you oh, just yeah, like you guys had a good crew watching that? It was, it was awesome. Beers were flying. Um, everybody was going crazy. It's just Kids so just drunkest guy in the room, I imagine. <laughs> <laughs> he was he was pretty tame. He was pretty tame. I've definitely been to some games where Kiz might have been the drunkest guy there in the stadium <laughs> of a hundred thousand people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's our guy. He's are like you, 140 pounds, drinks like he's 300 pounds. Are you just guys? Are you just like waiting to just absolutely destroy TCU or USC? I mean, that's gonna be. Yeah, I mean, TCU has found a way to win some games, I and mean, that you can't really teach that. So, I know Georgia's had this target on their back the whole year, but um, I would way rather play TCU or USC in the first round than like Tennessee or Alabama sneaking out. I, I do not it's want just, Alabama to somehow sneak in that fourth spot. It's just SEC bias, like you read about right there. <laughs> That's um, it. <laughs> no but, respect. But, uh, I mean, okay. What if Clemson? What if Clemson wins the ACC and they're one loss team? USC wins back twelve, one loss team. You're gonna have. There's gonna be a, a team or two that gets left out that has every right to be in the playoff so i guess that's gonna people are gonna clamor for having that 12 team playoff so nobody gets left out i know this is coming out in a couple of weeks but we got usa soccer here yeah are you right? excited i'm like looking at the clock 15 minutes we got usa soccer yeah i'm excited of course i'm excited yeah I, so I, I actually watched a lot of soccer during covid Premier League hey. was about the only thing on um during that time so i watched a lot of a lot of soccer um my in-laws are, are big Chelsea fans. So I watched a lot of Premier League and man, just love it. I, I love 
USA games. I'll, I'll watch anything that's USA and then brings the country together. Everybody can cheer for one team, and um, it's a lot of fun. We're, we're heading up to a, a bar here. Bubba Garcia is here in a little bit, and we're going to have some fun, and, and hopefully I can take down Wales and, and hopefully get through the group so we can have some more soccer to watch. Did you, uh, Riggs, before we let him go to that part, did you see uh, Billy Football's tweet about Wales? He goes, I never heard of Wales. How are you part of the, how are you part of Great Britain and you don't have a single alcohol that you're known for? <laughs> That's pretty, pretty good. good. There pretty you good. Go. I, I can't believe they don't allow alcohol in Qatar. Oh, yeah. I'm sure those, <laughs> I'm sure those fans are going nuts. Probably oh, the drug, the drug everybody. intake is probably going through the roof. Yeah, true, true. People know, figure like out a way. Drugs in that country probably the death sentence. So probably so. Uh, <laughs> probably getting yeah. stoned. Yeah, no bueno. Uh, all right, well, let's go USA. Good luck um, when this comes out. It's going to be uh, shootout week. The QBE, not the Shark Shootout week. So good luck you and you and your boy Cooch. Right, you guys are back. Oh yeah, appreciate it. All appreciate right. it. Going to be fun to watch. I think it's going to be on Golf Channel maybe, but. Yeah, looking forward to kind of the, the season winding down and, and looking forward to a big 23 and uh, play some majors, hopefully compete in some majors and, and see if we can make some noise. I love it. Well, we appreciate the time. This was fun. We'll do it again. And, yeah, good luck out there this week. And, um, yeah, hopefully we'll run into you on the, on the circuit. Sounds good. Sounds good. Appreciate you guys having me on. All right. See you, Harris. Thanks, Harris. Appreciate it. 